Thank you, Mosa. He just uh, included the uh, YouTube link into the chat meeting for those who want to share to other people. Mosa, I think there is no more people in the waiting room. Can you confirm me, please? Yes, that's right. Okay, so we will start the meeting now. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening uh, to everybody. For those who were not able to attend yesterday's sessions, my name is Barbara Galetti, technical advisor to Chile's delegation at IWC and convener of the Conservation Committee Intersessional Working Group on Cetacean and Ecosystem Functioning. I would like to thank everybody for attending the IWC workshop on socioeconomic values of the contribution of cetacean to the ecosystem functioning, and especially thanks to our distinguished speakers that have agreed to participate and collaborate into these efforts. The workshop look forward to learn about current advances in the socioeconomic valuation of the marine environment and cetaceans and propose strategies that will facilitate the conservation of cetacean and strengthen the resilience of marine ecosystems. Each session lasts three hours between 3 p.m. And, and 6 p.m. England time. It's being live streamed via the YouTube channel of the IWC, and it will be available for a short time in case some participants cannot be present at all sessions. Currently, there is available at the YouTube channel yesterday's session, so those who were not able to attend the session yesterday, they can see it from the YouTube channel. There is also a SharePoint site available where the participant can download background information. I would invite you to visit and check the SharePoint as there are new documents available that were contributed by uh, Mr. Robert Johnson. So thank you very much for that. And also I will uh, remind you to read the table for all the participants from the scientific committee uh, workshop with the conclusion of the cetacean threats. And I would like to uh, thanks Marcelo, Marcelo also for helping to fill table one. I just noted that he helped us to associate each uh, cetacean threats to particular ecosystem services. And we will come back later to this, uh, to this table pro probably more in depth during the next Monday session. So please mute your microphone when you are not speaking and use the raise hand function if you wish to ask a question or make a point. At yesterday's session, we had the opportunity to receive from Dr. Kitakato a summary of the outcomes of the IWC CMS scientific workshop on cetaceans and ecosystem functioning. It provided insights into nut nutrient circulation, ocean fertilization, whale falls, and trophic cascades. We also receive a presentation from Dr. Tavares on the traits shared by marine megafauna and their relationship with ecosystem functions and services. Last presentation from Mr. Marco Javorsek introduced us into the United Nations system of environmental economic accounting. We also have an interesting discussion to clarify concepts to be used and how this could be or not related to a socioeconomic valuation of any particular cetacean trust. This is the table available at the SharePoint and we will probably come back later. Today's sessions will be focused to review existing techniques and studies for estimating the socioeconomic value of the role of cetacean in the ecosystem function. We will have an intense sessions with five presentations 
And therefore, I would like to stop here and move directly into this agenda item number two to start reviewing existing technique and the estimate of market values and not market values. So I would like to introduce you, Mr. Ralph Chami, who is really advocating toward a nature positive economy. And he will present us today the case of oceans and cetaceans. He's currently assistant director at the International Monetary Fund and co-founder of Rebalance Earth. Mr. Chami, thank you very much for joining us at this workshop. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all. Uh, it's wonderful to be part of this event. Let me uh, get to my presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to share. Um, <clears throat> Are you able to see? Yes, thank you. All right, wonderful. Okay, so what I'd like to make a push for is how do we go from, uh, I have to stop the subtitles for some reason, it's appearing. All right, so make the, I'd like to make the case for why do we need to do a market valuation of, of uh, nature, um, nature ecosystem services and, uh, and just not to go beyond the valuation to basically explain why do we need to do so and what do we get in return for doing all this work. So let me, let me start and, and put things in context. Let's start with the COP26. One thing that was different about COP26 this time around, because I wasn't at COP25 and I was at the IUCN meetings. At COP25, uh, climate was there, but nature was absent. At IUCN meeting in Marseille, nature was present, but the climate folks were absent. At COP26, finally the two groups met and realized that we are not only facing just climate change, but we're also facing the demise of nature itself and its biodiversity. And that the two are linked through the human activity. So if we are really to make any difference in the fight against climate change, we need to also tackle natural capital, the risk to nature, uh, because these two risks, are, two risks are happening simultaneously. So we don't really have time to tackle climate and then natural capital or natural capital without climate. We need to handle both risks at the same time. And in order to do so, we really need to understand how we arrived at this point in time. And that's because our current economic system really uh, acts as if economy is outside of nature. So we can extract from nature here in the context of our meeting is the oceans with impunity, pollute the oceans with impunity and sort of get away with it. And the, what we're finding out is we're not able to get away with it at all. In fact, this behavior is really unsustainable, has led to contributed to the climate change risk and which has boomerang back to us in terms of natural capital risk or risk of loss of biodiversity and so forth. So if we are really to come out of this self-inflicted calamity, we really need to engage in what we, our ancestors already knew. I remember in one presentation, a tribal chief, uh, Indian chief uh, said, we, we learned to walk this earth softly. I think walking this earth softly, meaning recognizing that we all reside inside of nature and not outside of nature when nature is healthy and vibrant, we actually are doing well. And when nature is stressed, we're not doing so well, as we saw one example with COVID. So nature is critical to our health, is critical to our economic system. Oh, as a financial economist myself, when I hear, you know, when we say nature is macrocritical or critical to the economy, we need to start somewhere to make that case <clears throat> again. So the science, and we've gone over this a few times now, science tells us that the oceans, after all, for fifth of the planet are quite important. In the oceans, the phytoplankton are really the lungs of the planet. And the science also tells us that species are also important in, in many ways, aside from their intrinsic value in terms of their, the fight against climate change by capturing carbon, if you're talking about the great whales, 
the carbon carbon on their bodies or indirectly through their fertilization of the phytoplankton. They too have a role in fight against climate change. Uh, just quickly on land, their cousins, also the elephants in the forests of Africa, these are not the savanna elephants. This is a paper by Fabio Berzaghi, 2019, shows in Nature Journal, shows that the elephants of, uh, in the forests of Africa also help to sequester carbon in the forests by an additional seven to 14 percent. Going back into the ocean, uh, systems like salt marshes, seagrass, mangroves, kelp forests, and so forth also help to capture incredible amounts of carbon and sequester them in their roots. And also they provide other ecosystem functions such as defense against flooding and help to uh, increase the fish stocks. So what science have always been telling us and some more recently is that biodiversity is valuable. It's not really just about the ocean or and or its inhabitants, no. It's, flo it's, it's flora and fauna its species and, and blue, uh, blue carbon, its open ocean and coastal ocean, it's one system. They don't recognize these dichotomies that we create as humans. But what it's telling us also is that a living and vibrant nature is valuable, not a dead nature, not an extracted nature. Now we can do more than that. We can take this valuation that is in the science and make it into dollars and cents so we can engage consumers, markets, and policymakers. We did so in the case of the whale. We just looked at the carbon services of a whale. We said, how much is the value of carbon services of a whale over her lifetime? Recognizing that she gives birth to babies and babies give birth to babies and, and so forth. And you keep track of it. And it's a minimum lifetime earnings of $2 million just for the carbon sequestration alone. We can do so with the elephants, carbon sequestration alone service of a single elephant is over $1.75 million. If you're seated, here's something new for you. This is a report we just finished for Grid Arundel and UNEP. Uh, basically, we were asked, what is the value of carbon sequestration globally by seagrass? Well, I have news for you. It's over $1.5 trillion, imagine. This is the seagrass that is usually lost because the tourists complain that their feet touch the grass so you see at resorts, they're cutting, chopping off that seagrass in the morning. This is, this is truly gold. And this is, if you want to be even more shocked, if you add to it the value of flood control, it's another trillion dollars. If you add to it the impact on fishes, you're adding even more money. So nature is incredibly valuable to us. Science tells us it's valuable. We can value it as a finance people. We can value that, convert that valuation in science to dollars and cents, we can engage the public at large, but that's not enough if we really wanna make things, change things, okay? If we wanna create markets, markets around nature, we need to speak the language of markets. So first is we use their valuation, but then the markets say, is this really an asset? Who owns that asset? Who has the right to speak on behalf of that asset? This is where the policy is needed in the legal framing of the asset, or if you like to call it the codification into the law. Once you do that, once you have an asset and you codify it in the law, it becomes capital that you can put on your balance sheet. And then that's when the game really changes. If you ask which countries have actually engaged in making a difference? Well, guess what? Most recently, Chile now in the, in the draft of the, their, their, you know, there's a draft of the, for the new constitution. There's something called article nine. It will go through modification. I took a read of it. Very interesting, it says nature has rights. This is very recent, a couple of weeks ago. New Zealand, of course, is way ahead of everybody by conferring personhood on nature. Nature has rights and we have responsibilities toward it. Uh, Ecuador, if you like, also has it in its constitution. Costa Rica con conferred personhood on bees because they recognize how important they are to their economy. So once you have these two things, then things are changed things become, uh, you know, becomes, you go, you go from saying this is valuable in science, you put dollar amount becomes an asset, a natural asset. And markets are very tuned to the word asset because they can build services around it. Now you can talk about new wealth. Now let me show you an example of how this thing can work, okay? Let's go to something that's happening really cool in Chile. Chile has this new initiative called the Blue Boat Initiative. 
<clears throat> I, I've presented this to you in a previous meeting. And the Blue Boat Initiative aims to place these buoys in the Gulf of Corcovado and other places, basically to protect the, uh, the whales and other marine life by, <clears throat> by uh, these buoys have in real time can actually detect the presence of a whale, the species of a whale at, in real time in location and depth. It captures that data, sends it to a satellite, satellite sends it to a land center and the land center sends a text to the ship saying, hey, in your way is, is a humpback or a fin whale or a blue or a blue whale. So the vessel is informed of the whale's presence and the vessel is supposed to take action to avoid the collision. Now let's bring reality to this situation, right? Question is, what will the vessel really change course? Let's see, let's do approach it from a purely cost benefit analysis. So for the vessel to change course or to slow down to avoid hitting a whale it involves a cost because the ship is gonna be late for delivery. Okay, changing course involves, involves cost. So the captain has to make a decision. If I change course, I slow down, I'm gonna be late. I'm going to maybe fine for late delivery of my cargo. What if I were to hit the whale? What is the penalty? Guess what? It's zero. The penalty for killing a whale is zero. Nobody sees me. Even if they see me, what law is going to be applied? So what am, what am I going to do as a ship's captain? Although he may be a great proponent of whales, he's late on delivery. He's going to close his eyes and keep moving that ship. But we are here to show you how the market, I'm here to show you how the markets can work when you allow them to work. Here's how things can change. What if the government of Chile were to say, listen, if you hit that whale in my waters, in my waters, not in the open sea, there's a penalty. There's a study that actually already valued the Chilean whales at, at $2 million per whale. So if you hit that whale in my water and we can detect that you've done so, you're going to pay a penalty of $2 million. Now let's go back to this captain. He says, wait a minute, I may be late and I may be fine, but the fine is not 2 million. See, you start to change the behavior uh, if, you really, if you really want to protect the cetacean. So, but, but it's not over yet, it gets better. Because once, we, once the government of Chile, as an example, says you, if there's a penalty for hitting my whale, it based, the markets realize right away that there are assets in the water because they have a value and they're protected legally. So the insurance company is the first customer to call up the ship's owner and say, wait a minute, when I insured your ship, I didn't realize there was an asset in the water that you could damage. So either you're going to have, either I'm not going to insure you or you're going to pay me a higher premium or you're going to install something on your ship to keep you away from that way. Whatever it is, what you're seeing here is once, it, once a policy change is affected, the markets take, take notice of it, take it seriously. And both then the law and the markets work together to change the behavior of the, of the ships in the water. And some of these ships may be penalized or may, maybe lose their insurance, but others will be rewarded with lower premium and higher rating of their, of their IOUs. So in summary here, markets reinforce the message of the policy change and together change the behavior. Because we're, what we're after here is how can, how can markets be used to change humans' behavior towards the ocean? This is one way. There's another way. Markets can do a lot more than that, okay? <clears throat> Why? Because remember where we are right now. There's a climate change calamity upon us. So the market for carbon offsets is, is exploding. And right before you, the Ukrainian crisis, the, the price of carbon, ton of carbon on the European exchange was $110. It dropped to 68, and then it's back now to 70 something. So there's a market for carbon offsets. It's coming really from the Paris Accord. It started really with the Paris Accord and all these commitments to net carbon zero, carbon negative, carbon neutral by countries and by companies. The question has always been, where do we, where do, where does, where is that technology that's going to meet that demand? Where is it going to come from? Well, I'm going to use something that Greta says, there's a lot of blah, blah, blah on high tech. High tech can do this, can do that. None of it is proven. 
in front of us is nature. Nature is a big, has a big role to play in helping in the sequestration of carbon, but we have to unleash its ability to do so to help us. There's also even, even a price for carbon, as I said, right now, it's actually more than 60, it's in the $70 per ton. So what can we do? Well, I just thought I'd show you what we can do. If suppose, and we're looking here at a market for carbon offsets. So suppose, for example, the country, you know, I'm not going to name countries here. You have country, a country that has elephants, has whales, has seagrass, salt marshes, and so forth. They can sell the carbon offsets of these assets, natural assets, to whom? Well, to all, to all these companies here, the buyers, could be households who want to offset their carbon, offset, uh, carbon footprint, could be companies, industrial companies that want to offset their carbon footprint, could be financial companies that want to offset this, could be Microsoft, Google, you know, uh, GM, GE, whatever, they want to offset their carbon footprint. They are willing to pay money to buy those carbon offsets. So countries that have these assets, natural assets, can sell not the assets, the services, the carbon offset services of these assets, and the money can come all the way through to the recipients, in this case, be it an elephant, be it a whale, be it the mangrove, seagrass, what have you, looks after the asset and looks after the stewards of these assets, in this case would be the local and indigenous communities. We use blockchain technology just to make sure that we avoid all the hiccups of a new market, double counting, misrepresentation. So this is distributed ledger is to keep, you know, ensure transparency and traceability. If we were to do so, look how wonderful this thing would be. You get a, what's what we call a win-win-win model. Actually, there are four wins, but I got tired of saying the word win, I put three. Let me show you why. First of all, when you have that market, nature wins because you're saying a living and vibrant nature is not only valuable intrinsically, but in terms of dollars and cents. So the money comes in to look after nature, protect it and regenerate it. So you're creating resilience in nature. That's your first win. Whoever is selling the carbon offset, if it's the government that owns the asset, then the government is going to see the direct revenue coming in. But there's also indirect revenue because when the money comes in, people have more money in their pockets, they're gonna spend more, the tax base expands for the same level of taxes, you make more money. The government also gets to save on whatever it used to spend to protect those species because those species or the fauna or flora will pay for themselves. So you get an improvement in the fiscal stance of governments. Local community, that's your second win. Your third win, local communities get to benefit because the whole idea behind this is that the money should go directly to the local communities through stable income, through meaningful employment. Basically what you're doing, we are creating resilience of the local and indigenous people, keeping them on their land, keeping them where they are, they don't have to leave anymore. So that's your third win. Your fourth win is whoever is buying that carbon offset, let's say it's Microsoft, wants to offset its carbon, gets to say, not only did I offset my carbon, but I met my ESGs and I helped alleviate poverty, create employment, protect nature. The, basically they're hitting their SDGs. They are investing in a living nature. How much is that worth to a company? They have a conversation with sustainability officers, which I've been doing recently. It's very, everybody wants to be part now of a great citizenship of this world. They're looking to be part of this solution. And this is one way we can bring nature to markets or markets to nature in a positive way. Finally, here's, if you ask me, how do we do this, Ralph? How do we start? Where do we start? Well, if it's a country that has a natural capital, whatever that thing, the first thing to do is to ask the scientists in that country or the scientists that are experts, what do we have? Do we have mangrove, seagrass, salt marsh, whales, elephants, whatever it is, trees, forests? Do you need a scientific accounting of what you have? So once you do that, then finance, finance comes in and converts the value. Carbon is just a short game. You can talk about biodiversity measures if you like, convert it into dollars and cents, that's the valuation. Then you need the legal action. Otherwise, we're just dancing around doing nothing. We need the governments to take action and to say, just like they did in New Zealand, this is an asset of the state. 
Okay, once you do that, you've converted it from a natural asset to a financial capital that enters the balance sheet. At that point in time, the demand comes in because there's insatiable demand for carbon offsets or biodiversity offsets. Now, finally, before I stop, I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. What I'm talking about is not the sale of assets. I'm talking about the sale of services of the assets. The assets are retained by their local indigenous people or by the government, whoever owns them, retains ownership. What you're selling is simply the services of these assets. The money would come in to look after the assets in perpetuity, that's nature, to protect, preserve, and grow, and to look after the welfare of the stewards of nature who are the local indigenous population. What are we waiting for? I really don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph, for all this very interesting uh, presentation and perspective on how to build a system to advance on nature conservation involving the markets. Very, very good to hear about it during this workshop. And I want to open the floor now for any questions or comments on this. Marcello, please go ahead. Hi, Barbara. And hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Ralph, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Marcello from, from Costa Rica. And uh, we, um, Robert Costanza and myself and other colleagues, uh, and we're going to present this work later. We're working on a new governance uh, system for, for the ocean at different scales. And one, one particular issue that we want to address is transboundary assets in this way, right? Uh, transboundary species. Um, so in, in your presentation, which, which I love the, the case of Chile, I wasn't aware of that. You kept mentioning that the whales are Chileans, right? But that same whale could be in the waters of Costa Rica, right? For whale watching, for example. And, and, and we have a whole community here, like thousands of people that depend entirely on whale watching. So how do we develop a financial mechanisms that can distribute both the benefits and the damages of these transboundary species, right? If we put uh, a penalty on, on killing a whale in Chilean water, but perhaps Costa Rica, and this is a totally you know, arbitrary example, depended more on that whale that was killed in Chile, right? And the same thing with offsets, right? If we create carbon offsets for, for, for whales, it's not the elephant that stays in, I don't know, in some part of Africa, that whale moves around. And the whale at the end, it's owned, owned by several countries, but at the same time, it's not owned by anyone, right? So the, the, the problem of ownership to develop the financial mechanism here is, is key. So I would love to, to hear your reflection on this point. Thank you. May I answer or you'd like me to take more questions? This is an excellent yes. question. Yes, please go uh, and answer okay. directly now. I wish I had a whiteboard. I get up to a whiteboard and, and write down for you an, a, a, a game theoretic model, which will show you that all you have to do at the end of the day is for Chile to take that action. That's the, I'm going to give you the answer and then show you how you get to that answer. Because the whale, it's true. And in fact, when we wrote the first paper, I did say the whale is a global public good because it's visiting countries, but it's visiting countries not simultaneously, sequentially. When it's in the Chilean water, it's in the Chilean water at that point in time. So if it's hit in the Chilean water, it's the law of Chile. Now, if you tell me, well, it's 90% in Chile, but 10% uh, in Argentina, hey, then Argentina will say, but that, that, whale is also in my waters. And guess who benefits from that? The whales, because everybody's fighting to protect the whales. So the whales are talking to each other, say, man, we've never been loved like this before. They all want us alive. <laughs> so, so we can, I mean, look, there are many ways to solve this problem. This is not an insurmountable problem. When I wrote it in that piece of, in, in that first piece, I was just trying to say the whale brings good to all these countries, but sequentially, 
at any given point, it's in somebody's water, or it could be in the open sea. And that's actually a much more difficult, uh, you know, there's a solution to it, but that's a much more difficult. Let's, so it's in the Chilean water. Now, what Chile could say is, I have the technology Blue Boat Initiative to see that particular whale, because I can identify it. By the way, it's very costly. Let's say it costs $5 million. Uh, or yeah, what for, for uh, to install all these booths? I really don't know what the what the value is, but that is countered by the value of the living whales, and they have my understanding about five hundred of the blue whales. So five hundred times three million far exceeds the cost of putting these buoys. Anybody else that wants to claim the same thing has to have a technology to verify that those whales are in their water, and they would only do so if the benefit of a living whale if they can. That means we're watching, they can show that that same whale is in their waters, then they would actually get to share in the, in the, in the profit sharing or the revenue sharing equation. We have conventions for migratory species. Why don't we apply it in this case? We could think of a pot that the money goes in and then it's shared equally for the protection of the whales. It's not an insurmountable problem, but it is an issue, you are right. But it has a solution. If I were still in academia, I would write that IO paper. Or if I had a graduate student, I'd say, please write this. This would be your first chapter in your dissertation. There's a solution to it. There's a solution to it. But it, remember, all we got to do is one country to start doing this. And it says, I don't really care if it's resident, not resident. I'm going to do it in my waters. Every other country say, wait a minute, but that whale is mine. Well, they say, prove it. It's yours. You have to install the technology to show that it's yours. And you will only install it if you're, if you're fairly certain that it's in your waters. Otherwise, if we, so this, this, uh, this argument weeds out frivolous claims that that same whale is in your waters. But what you get out of it, if two countries can prove, is that the whales are being loved by two countries. How bad is that? Right now we fight over whales to kill them so that some countries can eat them. That's awful. We want them to fight over whales to keep them alive and well. Sorry, so ju just okay. a follow-up question. Can, can I do a follow-up here, Barbara? Okay, uh, do the follow-up question, Marcelo, and then I will give the, uh, the word to Elsa, and then we go back to Chami and close the, the, the question sessions to move to the next. Yeah, uh, super quick. Uh, thank you, Barbara, and um, th thank you, Ralph. Uh, yeah, I think that solves my, the first part of my question, but, but the other part where if we do offsets, then we cannot claim from two different countries the same offset because we would have a double accounting of the offset. So I don't know if you've thought about that as well. Yeah, so, thank so, you. so suppose, suppose we do it th this way. We can, if two countries can claim, let's say these wells are 50% in each country, okay? We can prove that. Then and they'll share in that, so the offset for the other country. There are ways around these things. There, you know, we, we already have migratory species, convention for migratory species, and countries basically agree on what to do in order to protect a, a migratory species. Just that nobody has ever worried about, nobody had thought there was a value to protecting those whales aside from just to basically make a buck off of them by, by just watching them. Here, what you're saying is we need to keep them alive not only because intrinsically there, they ought to be left alone, but because they are incredibly important to our own existence. So there is, you're right, but it's, it's a solvable issue. It's, it's a contract. Thank you, Mr. Tommy. I will now give uh, the floor to Elsa Cabrera and then uh, Jose Palazzo, and then we will close uh, the floor for other speakers to move to the next uh, presentation. Elsa, please. Thank you, Barbara. My name is Elsa Cabrera. And I'm from Centro de Conservación Cetacea Chile. Uh, great to see you, Ralph, again. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. I was just wondering that I don't know if I understood yesterday clearly one of the presentations that stated that the economic vision is 100% anthropocentric. And if there is not a direct value for humans, then that asset 
would not be would not have an economic value and i would like to know your view on this and how this uh, point of view can be broadened so we can really move forward into leaving out an anthropocentric vision of economy and have an ecocentric uh, vision where also the intrinsic value of the species are valued not as a direct asset maybe for a direct benefit to humans but as a chain of benefits that finally help us and supports the life on earth thank you i love thank this you. question um uh, you know Chan oh yeah sorry Can we hear the question yeah, from sure. Jose Palazzo and then Melanie Virtune and I will close the floor for more words and then you can answer the three of them. In... Please. Thank you. Jose, please. Yes. Uh, thank you and the IWC staff for organizing uh, this very important workshop. I was actually raising the wrong hand here. Uh, I'm an old timer with difficult technology, so thanks for your patience. Uh, and thanks for all for the presentation. I have the honor of uh, being a, a very small co-author with him of, uh, of an important working paper on this matter. Uh, just a, a couple of reflections. One is, is that uh, there are different, perhaps, uh, rights and obligations in relation to uh, whale populations and, and what do they do in different country waters. For instance, uh, I would suppose that Breeding grounds uh, in coastal states are perhaps a, a very important part of the of the migratory cycle of the whales. And countries with uh, uh, adequate protection of breeding grounds should be given perhaps uh, a, a bigger weight when talking about uh, the distribution of uh, benefits from uh, a carbon market um, strategy. And then uh, we should perhaps uh, try figure out. Uh, a proper system in which uh, communities and organizations working either for governments or in civil society uh, who protect this uh, particular vital uh, areas for uh, different populations of whales do get to see the benefits from this. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to see government agencies collecting this money or big international schemes being established and uh, not seeing this money filter to uh, actual whale protection uh, is probably gonna be a problem. And that's why uh, what Rolf mentioned about blockchain and transparency for these systems is something that's gonna be uh, really important. If we want to see uh, whale carbon assets properly quantified and uh, marketed. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, uh, please, Melanie. Hi, thank you for giving me the chair. Sorry, I was a bit late um, putting up my hand. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself yesterday, but Melanie Virtue from um, the Convention on Migratory Species. Very happy to, to be here in this workshop. Um, and, and yes, um, Ralph just, just mentioned CMS. And indeed, we've been in discussion with Ralph and Jose and, and others. And, you know, this is a really interesting idea, but it's I can see many complexities with the implementation. Um, CMS hasn't delved into carbon markets on anything yet. And um, yeah, especially species that exist both um, you know, in territorial waters, but also beyond national jurisdiction, I think are, are complex. Um, uh, but yeah, we look forward to talking more, um, but I think it's, it'll be a bit of a process to, to, to actually reach some kind of intergovernmental policy that's agreed on these on these subjects, but, but very exciting ideas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melanie, uh, Jose and Elsa. Uh, please, uh, Ralph. Can you... Thank you. These are all excellent questions. I could spend time and I, you don't have that time. So let, let me let me start with the first question, which is, do you worry that this is very much a, a, a human-centric uh, um, way of valuing uh, the, the services of a species? If we were to start from scratch, if we were all to go back to being babies and being taught the same thing, we wouldn't be here. If we were taught when we were kids that nature has the right to exist even for itself, even if it did nothing for us, then, would be all fine, we wouldn't be here. 
problem is that we are here because we all because of the human centric approach that we we thought you know we lived outside of nature as I was trying to explain that nature is boundless limitless is here to serve us all this uh, defunct ideas are there so the question is and by the way I didn't put a price on a whale as somebody said already the system puts a price on a whale and it is zero that's why you can kill a whale with impunity I'm just trying to tell you is that even if you were to use our own defunct system, a whale value of a living whale is not zero. It could be two billion, it could be three trillion, who knows? So the fact that the whale should exist in and of itself, intrinsically, I'm 100% with that. But we are living in a market system. In a market system, if you don't have value, you are not visible. That's, so what we're trying to do is to say, even if you never visit a whale in your life, even if you live in Nebraska, I used to live in Nebraska and Kansas, and you never see a whale in your life, that whale in the ocean is saving you. That whale service, if you were to pay it a salary, by the way, a living salary for a whale is about $64,000. I can calculate it for you. I work for the IMF. The IMF pays me a salary. Does it pay me a salary because it values my intrinsic value as a, as a father, as a son, as a husband, as a good citizen? No. It says, you, Ralph, you work for the IMF, you, you provide economic services, and we pay you a salary. Well, the whale is doing the same thing, is working on behalf of humanity, providing, capturing carbon on behalf of humanity. Should we not pay that whale a salary for her services? If you were to pay that salary, lifetime earnings would be at least $2 million. By the way, that's just minimum of $2 million because we didn't capture any of the other services that the whale does because we don't know what they are. We know some of them. And for some of them, we don't even have markets. So the idea of valuing and, and creating those markets is to educate the market, is to say to the market, people like me coming from the markets, there's value in the protection of a whale, of protection of nature, of a living nature. We are very, by the way, I've seen all estimates by now of the oceans. We, I hear people tell me, you know, the ocean is the seventh largest GDP in the world. It's all based on extractive services. It's all based on killing. <laughs> it's all based on extracting. Nothing about what I'm talking about, which is leave nature alone. If you leave nature alone, you'll be actually not be healthier, but you'll be wealthier. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The value of a whale in, in the model that I present is based on a living and thriving whale that frolics freely, not captured, not killed, not sold for its oil or not, for, not sold for its meat. That same thing applies for going beyond the whale. Let's talk about seagrass, salt marsh, all these things. These are living systems they have a right to exist and we can benefit from them. So there's no shame in saying there's the market value for their services. It's the problem is what do you do with that money, which is what Jose is talking about, which I very much, you know, I'm with him on this one, which is that money should come back to look after nature in perpetuity and to, to look after the stewards of nature in perpetuity. And these are the local and indigenous population who are the true stewards of nature. This is why blockchain technology and other things come in, in order to ensure that that funding goes where it's supposed to go, does not disappear in the government general budget. Okay, as far as the migratory species, I, I know I fully understand Melanie's point, but we got to start somewhere and time is not on our side. This is not business as usual, right? We, according to the UN, IUCN, we have less than nine years. And Sir David keeps telling us we're, we're supposed to live off of the interest on our natural capital, not eat into our natural capital because of the natural capital disappears, we, so will we. So we don't have time to go back to basic and educate people from the beginning about the value of nature by itself. We have to do it at the same time. The beauty of financial markets is they have over $16 trillion waiting to come in and they can move faster than governments. And let's be honest with each other. It's the tail that wags the dog. The politicians look at the markets. Once they see the markets are happy, they salute and they fall in line. 
So why waste your time on the politicians? Let's just go to the markets. And the markets are saying, bring us into this conservation business. You guys have been so arrogant. You only talk about CS, CSOs, activists, foundations, and governments. And you, people like me from the markets, are kept out. But we can be part of the solution. After all, we are also residents of this planet. And we do have children. And we do want to live forever through our future generations. So we need the solution. You need to speak the, the language of the markets, but you need to bring them in to do good, not bad. No privatization of assets, no, private, no privatization of natural capital. That's why I keep saying you retain the ownership of the asset, you just sell the services of the asset. I'll stop here. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Tani, uh, for your presentation and everybody for your interesting questions and challenging uh, for the futures, identify challenges. This is getting a bigger workshop than expected as it's going beyond just socioeconomic valuation and it's just building up a system. I would like now to introduce you to Dr. David Cook to present on assessing economic and sociocultural value of Wales ecosystem services. Dr. Cook works at the University of Iceland and his research concerns Arctic ecosystem services associated with cetaceans. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cook, and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's great to join you all from Reykjavik today. Um, so this presentation was actually originally due to be given by my boss, uh, Brynhilde Davistotter, um, but I hope our talks are going to be quite similar since all of our whale ecosystem services uh, related research derives from a Nordforsk funded project, um, which is called ArcPath. And this was a five year Arctic focused project, multi partner project um, that ended only very recently, just two weeks ago, when we had our final meeting in Tromsø. Um, so that work includes many published studies, some of which are in the um, uh, literature provided on SharePoint. What I'm actually going to present to you today are some of the findings from one of the synthesis papers. Um, so that's currently unpublished results that are in review with the Journal of um, Ocean and Coastal Management. So much, much of the talk um, in this workshop is obviously about the benefits of whales, particularly as we've just heard about regulation and maintenance ecosystem services such as carbon storage and therefore climate regulation. Um, but we must also remember that those whale ecosystem services themselves are being influenced and shaped by climate change. And then what we need to understand is what that might mean for local communities in the coming decades um, who rely quite heavily on those services in different ways. And that's something we explore in the synthesis paper of ArcPath through the case study of Skjavandi Bay in North Iceland. So uh, just to uh, give you a bit more background about the project, these are the overarching objectives of ArcPath and the synthesis paper to which I refer. Um, we were working on this in the latter part of 2021. We submitted it to a journal in uh, January 2022. Um, and this project paper rather ties together some of the overarching research strands of the project. So those relate to climate predictions, considering what those effects might entail for whale distributions in Skiavandi Bay, and then considering both implications to whale ecosystem services and also possible adaptation needs of the affected community in the decades ahead. Uh, so just quickly, where did the work of our team at the University of Iceland sit within that overall project? Um, so we were located uh, within Work Package 4, principally Task 4.4, which involved analysis of trade-offs between different ecosystem services um, derived from multiple uses of cetaceans. So we explored this in different ways to identification of whale ecosystem services and different case studies, valuation, both economic and sociocultural. And I know other speaker, speakers are going to go into more detail about maybe those methods. And also we consider management implications, including from the perspective of interactive governance. 
Um, so you can see how our final study on the impacts of climate change on wired ecosystem services in Skjaldbandi Bay required inputs from Work Package 3 here, uh, the downscaled climate models of our team, and that fed into our work on wired ecosystem services in Work Package 4, and that in turn has consequences for the connected package um, on management. Right, um, before we get into the methods and results from the synthesis paper, I just wanted to briefly show you an inventory of the main whale ecosystem services that applied to our study sites in Arkpath, which were in Greenland, Iceland and Norway. So this uh, table was included in one of our first publications from the Arkpath project in 2019. Um, also published in Ocean and Coastal Management, and it was called Reflections on the Ecosystem Services of Wales and Valuing Their Contribution to Human Wellbeing. This is also in the literature on SharePoint. What we find is that there's a broad array of services grouped in accordance with the CISIS classification, that's the Common International Classification for Ecosystem Services. Although the cultural services might be the most numerous and recreation in the form of um, well watching tourism, might be the most significant benefit if measured monetarily. We have found, uh, certainly, certainly using market data, um, we have found in some of our work that the regulation and maintenance services are the most highly valued by the public. So if you take a look at the socio-cultural valuation study of Skjaldbandi Bay by Malina Skater et al, 2021 in the, in the literature, you will see that that is the case. So that is non-monetary valuation of those services such as uh, carbon storage. Right, so coming to the case study for the synthesis paper, um, Husavik, Skjaldvandi Bay. So Husavik is the town in Skjaldvandi Bay. Uh, it's in North Iceland, it faces out onto the Arctic Ocean. Um, it was formerly a prosperous fishing area. It's now more commonly known for whale watching since the commencement of that activity in 1995, where it's, this is of course, especially the case in Husavik where the uh, locals have uh, given the town the self-proclaimed well-watching capital of Europe title. Um, despite the small size of Husvik, it's only 2,323 inhabitants, it is certainly very popular for well-watching. In fact, in 2019, the last year before the pandemic really intervened into Iceland's tourism, 115,000 well-watching trips took place in the bay. So that's just under one third of all the well-watching that takes place in Iceland. So connecting the dots, that's the title of the synthesis paper. What did we actually do in this study? So first of all, we conducted a global literature review of the impacts of uh, climate change on cetaceans. The academic literature is certainly increasingly focused on this topic, not least because of the long distance uh, migratory pathways from breeding grounds to feeding grounds and so on. So in this study, we, it, which was global, as I say, we also highlighted Arctic specific examples from the literature. Admittedly, these are not quite so frequent as of yet. Um, we then sourced downscale climate data from work package three of ArcPath, as I said, and focused specifically on the issues of sea surface temperature and high wind speeds, and also looked at past log data from whale watching um, from our team. And based on all of this data, we were able to test to see if changes to sea surface temperature in the not too distant past were translating into distribution of effects on whales. Then also consider whether extremely windy days are likely to become more common and potentially prevent whale watching in the future. And we did this primarily up to the year 2050 as the main horizon of the analysis, but we also looked further forwards up to the year 2100. Okay, so just to say that when we were looking forwards, we applied three of the IPCC's main climate scenarios to consider whether uh, potential, those potential implications for sea surface temperature and windy days and how they varied. So we had three scenarios here. We had SSP1, which we might consider to be a low emission scenario in accordance with maybe a 1.5 or a two degree world. We had intermediate emissions, probably where we're, roughly where we're heading around a three, 3.3 degree world. And then SSP3, that's more, more akin to business as usual, high emission scenario. Then we were interpreting those respective scenarios in terms of sea surface temperature implications and whether 
incidents of windy days of more than either seven meters per second or 10 meters per second would actually increase as we go forward. So those tend to be the thresholds in Iceland at least of which whale watching is prevented. Um, so how do the methods interrelate? This is uh, just simply extracted from the paper. Um, most of this is what I've already explained in words. Uh, but one thing maybe to point out is that even though our focus in this study was on climate implications on whale watching principally, this ecosystem service will never be affected alone. So there are of course bundles of cultural ecosystem services that might be affected in tandem, such as artistic inspiration, aesthetics and community identity. All of these will vary if the different whale species that appear in the bay, if they become more or less abundant in the future. So it's not just looking at this one ecosystem service in isolation, there's a sort of a connection with other cultural ecosystem services and multiple impacts to human well-being. Right, uh, the literature review findings. So I'm not going to go into uh, what is quite lengthy detail concerning the global literature review, but um, suffice to say, we identified three core categories of impact. Um, firstly, that we are seeing changing whale distributions and migratory patterns across the planet. Secondly, that climate change is affecting prey availability, often shifting it further northwards, certainly in the Arctic region. And in turn, that is often what is driving those changing distributions and migratory patterns. And thirdly, especially in the Arctic again, we're seeing changing trends in sea ice and ocean temperatures. So um, with regards to the Arctic, just to summarize as briefly as I can, there have been more common detections of blue whales in recent years and decades. Uh, in contrast, um, populations of Mickey whales have generally been declining. And this actually matches with earlier predictions um, about climate change that suggested that increased sea ice would lead to declining krill and minke whale populations due to the reduced prey availability for those whales. And that was the, the finding of an Icelandic scholar, Gisli Vikingsson, in 2014. He reported low prey diversity of minke whales in Icelandic waters and determined that changing distributions of both um, humpback and fin whales in those waters were likely driven by uh, prey changes caused by increased sea sur surface temperature and sea surface height. Um, there's also a need to consider uh, the impacts of climate change on the whales. Um, so as whales are migrating into new Arctic waters, especially further north, there could also be the potential for them to sometimes venture into areas with reduced environmental protection, increased commercial activities such as shipping, such as oil and gas production, as was talked about in Ralph's presentation. And there could be increased risk of ship strikes and other events that increase stress without proper management. So um, here are the outcomes from the log data from whale watching boats over the period 1995 up to 2017. So in this graph, we have percentage of sightings from whale uh, watching trips on the left y-axis and sea surface temperature is represented on the right y-axis and also by the green line in the graph. And what we see, first of all, is an upward trend over the past 22 years in Scalvandi Bay in sea surface temperature of about 1.5 degrees. That is considerable. We also see data that matches with the outcomes for the Arctic that I just mentioned from the literature review. So the minke whales here highlighted in pink, um, these have been declining in appearances. The blue whales, um, which are um, highlighted here in this red color, um, these started appearing in the early 2000s. Humpback whales in the blue line, these are up. And a species that I did not actually mention in the literature review, the white beaked dolphins here in the purple line, these are slightly down. We found no real discernible change uh, for the harbor porpoises in yellow. So um, sea surface temperature past and projections, what has happened and what is projected to happen in the coming decades for sea surface temperature in the Skjalvandi Bay? Uh, now, our data from work package three of ArcPath again reinforces the roughly 1.5 in degrees increase in sea surface temperature that you saw in the previous chart. If we go forwards to 2014 and 2050, 
What's interesting is that there is not that much by way of difference in terms of further anticipated increases in sea surface temperature. That is regardless of the climate scenario, whether it's that SSP1, that SSP2, or SSP3. Um, it's only really after this period, as we head towards the end of the century, that the respective greenhouse gas emissions intensities of economies translate into a significant divergence. And at the end of the century, this could be potentially as much as a two degree uh, difference in sea surface temperature between SSP1 and SSP3. And you can see over the period just from 2020 up to 2100, potentially here we're seeing a five degrees increase in the sea surface temperature in this, in this region. That is, again, uh, considerable. Um, what we can say based on our climate modeling analysis is that as an absolute minimum, we can expect to see at least a further one degrees increase in sea surface temperature by 2050, potentially more as the graph indicates. And increase of the, increases of this scale have already occurred, as you can see from the past, and um, these have been driving the climate change impacts we report in the literature review. So coming to the statistical analysis, uh, let's briefly show you the results of our regression analysis. So have recent changes in sea surface temperature been affecting those percentage sightings of whales in Scalpandy Bay? So we did this in three ways. We ran linear regression models with no time lag, a one year lag, and a two year lag. It makes sense to incorporate lags because of course, as sea surface temperature increases, that doesn't necessarily immediately translate into an effect on the distributions or the abundance of whales in a particular location. So we see statistically significant effects for all the minke whales under all scenarios. So with no time lag, increased sea surface temperature is found to be st statistically significant influence on declining sightings of minke whales, that's at the 5% level. If we include the time lag of one year, this was found again to be statistically significant for minke whales, again at 5% but also in terms of the increased percentage sightings of blue whales, almost at the, the 1%. Applying a time lag of two years, again, we see statistically significant relationship, as I say, for the minke whales, this time at the 10% level, but also now for the white beak dolphins as well. So again, at the 5% at the level in that case, there were no other statistically significant relationships found in our study. So finally, um, some effects with no statistically significant impacts as far as we can tell from our data. So we ran our respective climate scenarios to see if instances of windy days, in this example, days where we have a, a typical wind speed of more than seven meters per second, whether these days, we were looking at whether these days were likely to increase. And we found that at most by 2050, these translate into around a 1% increase in canceled trips compared to our baseline data from 2019. Essentially no change, therefore. Um, but it must be um, admitted, I think, that at the very least we need some better data to fully analyze this. Um, the decision about whether a whale watching trip goes ahead is of course um, quite complex. It's not just about wind speed, it's also about wind direction. It's also about the tides, it's also about sea surface height, it's also about the general inclemency of the weather at a particular point in time. So there's all these other variables that need to be factored into the decision of the whale watching operator. And what's more, we also need more baseline data, ideally on cancelled trips, ideally not just from one year, but also multiple years and also from multiple companies as well. It was not easy to get hold of that information. So uh, coming to the implications of the study and to sum up what we found, um, I suppose you could say we have much better understanding of the past and of reasonable confidence that changes to sea surface temperatures driven by climate change are indeed affecting whale distributions in Scalvany Bay in Iceland and presumably also in other Arctic locations as well. It's almost certain that there will be further significant increases in sea surface temperatures in the coming years, at least over the next three decades and beyond. And those effects in the Arctic are likely to be more pronounced than elsewhere on the planet. You might say that those effects are already priced in up to 2050, regardless of what we now do in terms of abatement of emissions. 
What we can be less confident about in the future is what this will mean for whale distribution. So will, for instance, humpback whales continue to be sighted more often? Will minke whales continue to be sighted less, less so often? Will new species appear in these waters, transitioning further northwards due to climate change? We cannot say this with any certainty. And in future research, what we need to develop are dynamic predator prey models that factor in the likely impact, impact implications of climate change. And we also have to ask the question, how would a community such as Husabik in Scalvandi Bay cope if the whales disappeared entirely? This was the case a few years ago in 2014 to 2016 in Tromsø in Northern Norway, which many people attribute to the effects of climate change driving the herring further north. The whales followed, of course, and whale watching suddenly declined and, and actually disappeared as an industry in the city of Tromsø. So Husavik has already successfully transitioned from being a fishing town. It then lost its quota in the mid 1990s. It became a whale watching destination. But the question is, would it have another solution if this key local industry was to actually no longer be there? And then there are also questions about how climate change impacts are integrated into governance mechanisms. So they certainly are not in the case of the current whale sanctuary designation for Scalfandi Bay, but could potentially be included in a future management plan for a marine protected area. That's something that has been much talked about in this region for more than two decades, but has never actually progressed any further. Um, so thank you very much and um, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, David, for uh, such an interesting presentation relating uh, the climate change and other indicators to the ecosystem services of, of whales. Another point of view to the entire work workshop. So thank you very much for your presentation. It is already almost uh, 10 past uh, four. Uh, we will have five minutes questions and then we will shorten the break for just 20, 10 minutes to not delay too much the other presenters. So please, uh, who want to take the floor and have questions to the uh, presentation from David. Is there any questions or clarification for David's presentation? It seems no. So uh, thank you very much, David. It was uh, perfectly understandable, your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that. And we will have a break for 10 minutes and we reconvene at uh, 4.20 in UK time. Thank you.
Hello. Again. Good morning, evening, or wherever to everybody. We are reconvening the sessions. Um, we will now come to the next agenda item. The presentation of Mr. Robert Johnson. Mr. Johnson is professor of economics at Clark University. His research interests include economic valuation, benefit transfer and ecosystem services with an emphasis on aquatic Ripanian and coastal system. He will not now present on estimating use and non-use values for ecosystem impacts of aquatic species, design and application of state preference method. Thank you, Robert. Please okay. take the floor. Great, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. There we go. Can you see that? Hopefully. Yes, thank you. Okay, fantastic. So um, despite presenting only on Zoom for, for many years, it still feels weird to do the sitting down, but I'll do my best. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, first, an introduction into how one might think about doing applied valuation more broadly for the sorts of things we looked in, at in the table yesterday, um, and then focusing on one specific type of valuation, that being stated preference valuation. Um, sometimes uh, people think of this as uh, survey-based. So just as background, right? But for all types of valuation methods. Um, so for any types of type of valuation of ecosystem impacts, you have to start with a rigorous definition of the values to be estimated, right? You, you can't move all the way to just start starting to estimate values until you know what exactly it is that you're estimating. So what does this mean, right? So no matter what type of value you're looking at, um, you first need to have a well-defined set of changes, ecosystem or environmental changes that are valued directly by beneficiaries or people. In other words, what exactly is the thing that people are valuing? Are valuing? What, what increases their welfare, right? In this case, related to cetaceans and ecosystem functions. We need to have a well-defined set of beneficiaries. Whose values are we talking about? We need to have a well-defined set of economic values. And what we mean by that is, how, how do beneficiaries benefit, right? So how is this ecosystem change affecting their well-being or welfare? And then what type of valuation method is appropriate for whatever type of values, beneficiaries, and measures you're talking about, right? So, so you have to kind of lay out those four things. We, when we're doing this, when we're thinking about ecosystem service valuation, one of the challenges is that there's so many different ways that that web of ecosystem functions and changes and services can affect people, right? So typically we think about three different ways that, that effects can happen. The first is a direct or final effect on benefits. So for example, fish abundance to anglers. If you have more fish, people who wanna catch the fish are better off and we can measure those values. That's a direct effect, right? You don't need anything else to change before having more fish makes recreational anglers better off or commercial fishers for that matter. You can also have intermediate or indirect effects, right? These are things like nutrient concentrations, right? So, so you have a whale falls that affects nutrients in all sorts of ways. Okay, it's not that people value those nutrient changes directly, right, in any way, although there might be small non-use values in concept, but in general, it's not the nutrients that people value. It's the things that come from the nutrients, right? Maybe the nutrients affect affect plankton, which affect other species, which affect fish, and maybe there's non-use values, and maybe there's other things, right? So these are all indirect effects. And to value those indirect effects, you have to trace them all the way through to measure the things that people care about, right? You can't generally value them by themselves without knowing what they cause, right? And then you, you have also, also have things that are, have both direct and indirect value. Right. And so they, they're valued in and of themselves by people, but they also affect other things that have value. 
right? And so these things can really get complicated. So before you can get to valuation, you really have to think conceptually about how those values arise, right? And, and one critical thing is if you, if you only understand the intermediate changes, say the changes in nutrients, but you don't know what happens due to those changes, you really can't estimate values for them, right? And so that's a challenge because even before as an economist, I can step in and do my job, I need ecologists, biophysical scientists, modelers to tell me what's going on in the natural system, right? And so what we're after in the case, thinking about effects of cetaceans on ecosystem functions, we want to know what those final valued impacts are after you trace everything through the ecosystems. So how do we do this? Well, this is kind of conceptually what we're after, right? I don't have one of these for cetaceans because I'm not a cetacean expert, but I've worked on these in lots of other settings. Here's ones we developed as just as an illustration for mechanical thinning of forest, right? Where you, you cut certain trees down to, to allow the forest to open up a bit, right? So how, how would we think about the values related to ecosystem effects of mechanical thinning? Well, first we start about thinking about how it changes ecological conditions and functions. So it changes forest structure. It changes forest floor structure, right? So things like fuel load for fires, understory density, connectivity, right? But it's not that those things are valued. Those are just, that, those are just ecological functions and, and conditions. So now we move to the right, right? So how, does, how do we move towards things that value that are affected by people? Well, maybe you're gonna affect wildfire prevalence. Maybe you're gonna sequester some carbon. Maybe you're gonna affect water supply and filtration. Okay, now we're getting closer to people. Then we move further to the right. Why is it that people care about wildfire? Well, one of the effects is on air quality. Others, and so now again, so we move further and further to right until we finally get to ecosystem services, the final things that people value. Things like they don't want to be subject to fire risk, right? They want to be able to see wildlife. Maybe hunters want to hunt deer, whatever it is. And from there, then we can think about the value and how we would measure it. So, so when, as soon as I saw that, that, that uh, spreadsheet that we talked about yesterday, immediately I'm thinking, okay, well, what's the causal chain, right? And this is what a causal chain might look like, at least as a simple illustration, they get a whole lot more complicated. Once you get all the way to the, to the right-hand side, then we can think about what kind of values come out, right? Well, and, Professor Johnson? Yeah. Yes. Just a little interruption. Yes. I receive a message from people that is not uh, English speaking. If you mm -hmm. could uh, talk slow more slowly, slow down. All sorry. right, sorry. <laughs> I've only got 15 minutes. Okay, I will try to talk slowly. This is the hardest thing for me to do. So, as economists, when we think about value, we typically split up values into multiple types. The first split is between use values and non-use values. Use values are values related to things we can see, things that people do, like whale watching, like fishing, like all sorts of things. So it's where we can see a behavior that generates values, though it can be direct or indirect. We also have non-use, sometimes called passive use values. These are values that people get that we can't trace to any behavior. For example, non-use or existence values. I just feel happier. I My welfare is higher knowing that northern right whales exist in the Atlantic Ocean, right? And, and if I could, I would be willing to pay to guarantee their existence. I can't go and buy that in a market, so you can't see that value, but it's there. Those are non-use values. Once we determine what type of values, then we can determine what kind of method we can use to value them, to quantify those. Market valuation methods, we use things that people buy and sell in markets. Revealed preference methods, we use other types of behavior. For example, like where people might go to the beach or where people might choose to go fishing. Those are behaviors that we can observe, where people choose to buy a house, right? And what housing values are, for example, a hedonic property value method. Those are really nice in that we're observing behavior, but they can only measure use values, values linked to behavior. Stated preference methods are survey-based methods. The disadvantage is we're relying on survey responses, which adds some additional challenges. 
The advantage of stated preference methods is they can measure all types of values, use values and non-use values. In fact, they're the only broadly accepted method that can measure non-use values. So if you think that there are major non-use values involved from these effects on ecosystem function, the only way to measure them is using stated preference methods or survey-based methods. So there's lots of evidence in the economic literature that individuals and households realize use and non-use benefits or values from many different types of aquatic ecosystem change, right? There's, there's hundreds of, of articles showing different types of values for changes in aquatic ecosystems. Um, some of these are very good studies, others of them are not so good, but there's a lot of them. We typically quantify these values using measures of willingness to pay or willingness to accept. I wanna emphasize that these are theoretical measures of value. No matter what valuation method you use, you are generally measuring willingness to pay or willingness to accept if you're talking about individual people, not firms. Some people assume that willingness to pay automatically means contingent valuation, that's not true. If you, are, if you use recreation demand modeling to value whale washing trips, you are probably measuring willingness to pay, whether you know it or not. Okay, again, the valuation methods you use depend on how those ecosystem changes affect people, right? And so you have to go back and think about that causal chain, think about what kind of values. Um, and just be aware that many values related to ecosystem function cannot be estimated using market revealed preference methods. There are no methods available. Sometimes there are methods that we can use market or revealed preference methods to measure these values, but sometimes stated preference methods are the only methods available. So that's you know, why I like to work with them. So what I wanna do with the remaining time is to just give an example of a stated preference method and show how one might use it. So these methods estimate measures of value using survey questions, right? And what we're doing with these surveys is eliciting information, asking how people would behave under hypothetical but realistic scenarios. Contingent valuation is the oldest form. These go back to the 1960s. More recently, people tend to use discrete choice experiments, which allow people to estimate values for individual ecosystem outcomes. Um, again, there's a lot of these methods that are used. So I'm going to show you an example of a discrete choice experiment. What a discrete choice experiment does is it asks survey respondents to choose or vote between different policy scenarios. Would you like A or B? Where A or B are multiple are described by multiple attributes, right? So different types of ecosystem changes add a different cost to the household. Usually one scenario is no change. You get no change and you pay nothing. Right, so effectively we're, we're, we're asking people what they would buy or vote for if they could, right? And so what we do is we present a lot of different people with many different scenarios. We see how people would vote across these scenarios and that tells us the trade-offs that they would be willing to make. And we use that to calculate their values. The easiest way to show this is to, is to use an example, All right? So, um, I'm just going to move quickly because I don't want to take up all of your time. What I want to show you here, I don't have an example of a discrete choice experiment for cetaceans and ecosystem functions, but I do have one for, for ecosystem functions due to fish restoration. And this was the one we did a number of years ago. Um, it's a little bit old, but it's a good illustration. So in Rhode Island, in, in the Northeast US, we were asked to estimate values for removing dams or providing fish passage that would allow migratory fish, alewife, herring, shad, and eel to migrate up all these rivers in red that you can see. All those little triangles are dams that are blocking the fish from migrating upstream. And policymakers wanted to know what kind of values would result if we could let fish get past some of those dams and spawn upstream. Many of these values relate not to the fish, but to the ecosystem functions that result. So what we were asked to do in this case was not only value the fish, 
but the resulting ecosystem changes. We developed a, a discrete choice experiment. It took us about two and a half years to develop and test the survey, worked together with ecologists and economists. We pre-tested the survey with 12 focus groups and many individual interviews to make sure that it worked. And one of the things we really focused on was developing that causal chain and understanding what it was that people valued and how to measure it in the survey. So these are pages from the survey. We actually, we implemented this using a mailed survey book and these are just copies of some of the pages in the survey, not all of them, right? So the survey explains how dams affect migratory fish. It shows where fish can go and where they can't go. Then we have some pages describing the ecosystem impacts. For example, migratory fish are part of the food chain. Other animals eat fit, right? And so this is going out to the public, right? So we have to describe things very simply. Then we describe what we call our attributes, the different ecosystem changes that might happen in these future scenarios. For example, you might have more habitat available for fish the populations in these areas would be more likely to survive. You might have more catchable fish that you can catch as an angler. There'll be more fish dependent wildlife in the area, other animals that eat fish. We also included an aquatic ecological condition score, an index of biotic integrity, because our focus groups told us that they really valued just the overall health of these river systems. In addition to effects on fish, on other things, they really wanted to know that these overall food webs and aquatic systems were healthy. So we used an index of biotic integrity to measure that. Okay, and so we, so we describe what the index is, we tell them what goes into the index so they know exactly what it means. This is what a discrete, this is just an example of one of our discrete choice experiment questions. There were 180 different ones of these questions with different numbers in the boxes, right? So in this case, you can either vote for the current situation, I don't want any change and I want to pay zero, or I can vote for a possible project A or project B that have different effects on these river systems, different direct effects, fish habitat and fish survival, and different indirect effects on ecosystem function in the red box. For example, when you have more herring, more large fish like bass will eat those herring and you can catch those fish. That's due to an effect on ecosystem function. Also, fish dependent wildlife like otters and mink will eat those fish. And so there's more of these species that are common in the area, right? In the Patuxent watershed, that's an ecosystem function effect. And also the effect on aquatic ecological condition, our index of biotic integrity. So you give, so we had 180 of these different questions. We split them up into 60 different booklets and those got mailed out to, to 2,400 Rhode Island households about half of those surveys were, re were returned, about a 48% response rate. And what the model does it, is it predicts how people will vote and how they trade off money, the cost of their household for these different types of direct and indirect effects. And after you crunch the numbers, this is just an example of some of the outputs that you might get. So WTP, that is on average, what our households would be willing to pay their value per household per year in US dollars per percentage point. So notice that these are measured in percentage points. So for a one percentage point change in aquatic ecological condition, say from 65 to 66, each household would be willing to pay 79 cents per year for that change. Now that doesn't sound like very much, except con consider now that we're multiplying that by over a million households in Rhode Island each and every year. And that's for every one percentage point change. So these values get very large, very quickly, right? And that's the interesting thing about non-use values is that anybody can have them, right? You're not limited to people going on whale watching trips. And interestingly, the interest here catch that's 
that's the only real use value here. And it's the smallest value and it's not significant. So what we're finding here is that non-use values, for example, due to overall ecosystem function measured by our index of biotic integrity are some of the largest values we see. In other words, we're, what we're finding is that people have very large non-use values for these ecosystem function effects. In this case, due to fish, not whales, but you could use, do something very similar in a marine environment with cetaceans. So that's a really quick summary of a whole lot of stuff. Hopefully it was useful. Um, the goal of the illustration was just to demonstrate how you can develop these kinds of applications and how you might apply similar types of approaches for um, to address cetacean effects on ecosystem function, right? So you could easily develop with appropriate modeling and expertise and, and causal chains, you can develop these approaches easily um, for cetaceans. Um, requires a means to quantify and link these functions to final outcomes and ecosystem services valued by people. That's why filling out that spreadsheet we showed yesterday is so important. Without that done, you can't move on to valuation. What goods and services are important? How do they provide values and to whom, right? And the nice thing about stated preference methods, these aren't the only methods, you can use other ones, but they can provide estimates of both use and non-use values, which other methods can't. Um, typically requires interdisciplinary collaboration. I can't do this alone as an economist. Um, and just keep in mind that there are a lot of, of not very good contingent valuation surveys and discrete choice experiment surveys out there. Validity and reliability of these numbers depends critically on best practices. That survey that I showed you took us almost three years to design, right? You typically aren't going to be able to sit at your desk and design one of these surveys in a week and send it out and expect that your values are going to be valid. It really depends on careful development, pre-testing. And there are articles out there um, that I can point you to that, that, that explain what those best practices are. So that is all I have. And, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or have any discussions. Thanks. Thank you, Robert, for your presentation. Very illustrative of the methods that can be used. And I will now give the floor for questions or comments to Robert's uh, talk. Is there any comment from the participants? It seems known. Well, Charlotte Nee Hart, please. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And uh, uh, you slow down very well when you want to. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I've got a question. It's uh, uh, I would like to have your uh, your thoughts, your reaction uh, after this, this uh, very interesting presentation and among other concerning uh, uh, the dam uh, uh, studies uh, you, you have done and uh, the eel issue. Uh, uh, I would like to have your reaction um, uh, um, concerning the previous uh, presentation uh, because uh, in one table uh, we saw that uh, in within the ecosystem service, uh, all base products uh, deriving from rubber or well bone teeth uh, on food product were included. So I know that human are within the ecosystem, but uh, I was a little bit uh, uh, surprised to see. Um, for example, the oil based product, which is not uh, a product uh, directly uh, uh, impacting the uh, ecosystem, it's uh, on a man made product. Um, and so I would like to have your, uh, your reaction and your uh, uh, analysis uh, on this uh, point, please. Um, so, um, so my general reaction is that, um, and if I understand your question, um, is that that certainly um, I don't 
I don't see any evidence that we that we that we in any way understand the full set of ecosystem services provided by whales yet. Um, we can understand some of the market products, or uh, we actually have fairly good understanding of the values due to market products. Those are are almost always the easiest things to value, right? Because we see people making market transactions. Those are super easy, right? So so market values are. It, piece of cake. Recreational values are also fairly easy, right? Although even then, for example, if you have, have whales affecting the nutrient cycling in aquatic ecosystems, those might be affecting fisheries in ways that we don't understand yet. And if those fisheries are becoming richer, better in certain areas, and that's benefiting um, commercial fishers or recreational anglers or, or affecting people in, for example, maybe uh, maybe penguins are eating some of those fish and that's benefiting that, that maybe that's creating larger, healthier um, Antarctic penguin populations. I don't, I'm making this up. I, I don't know, but there's all sorts of effects that one could envision small and large. And, and my understanding is we just don't know what those are. And, and we certainly don't understand what the values are. Right. So I would say we are, just at the beginning of understanding what these values really are. Um, and it's, some of them might be large, some of them might be small because, you know, because again, the extent of the value depends on the extent of the ecosystem impact. But, but I guess I would say that, that, that we do understand some things, but they're largely the things that are somewhat easy to measure, right? The market values, the recreational values, the whale watching, and it's excellent that we have those values but there's a lot of things we still don't know. I think that was your question, but I'm not sure. It, it was part of my question, but um, uh, more, more deeply, my, my question is, do you include the human consumption in your ecosystem uh, uh, services? Yes, you, you do. So, so if, if you're looking for total ecosystem service values, Yes, you would include human consumption, you would include ecosystem impacts. Um, I was focusing primarily on, on ecosystem function impacts um, just because that was the title of the, the, the agenda. Um, and, and in some, yeah, but, but in general, you know, whether you're talking about whales or say forestry, um, you would consider the consumption impacts, for example, the, the timber you get from the trees that you sell along with the ecosystem function, ecosystem function impacts. So yeah, you would add those all together. You'd have to worry about potential double counting, but yes, you, you would want to include all of those. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Is there anyone else that would like to take the floor? It seems known, so I will want to ask a question to uh, Professor Johnson. Uh, yesterday and uh, also today also mentioned that if there is no direct value for the humans, the beneficiary, so it is not considered like an ecosystem services mm -hmm. to be evaluated. But with the state preference method, is it possible to evaluate, which is not directly related to our benefits, like example, the existence of a, a shark that is um, being benefited by some whale sloth skin, for example? So, so it, it's an excellent question. And the answer is that, that because these surveys are being completed by people, right? It's always a value for a person. Now, a person can have a value for ecosystem impacts that don't affect them physically or that they don't use, right? So for example, maybe a, a shark eats a whale carcass um, and that's a, a rare shark and maybe I'll never see that shark and never use it, but, but uh, boy, I'm really happy that great white sharks exist in the, in, the, in the wild and I have existence values for those sharks and, that, and I answer my survey that way, right? I say, yes, I'd be willing to pay, I'd be willing to vote because I really value having more sharks in, in the water. Um, that's still a, a value to me. It's a value to a person, but it's a non-use value. It's, 
as an economist, I wouldn't consider that an intrinsic value. An intrinsic value to me is something that that isn't about me, right? It's not a value I hold as a person, it's a value nature holds. So to a certain extent, we're splitting philosophical hairs a little bit, but stated preference methods only measure values to people. Um, and again, for, for the prime, one of the primary reasons we know that is because these surveys are only completed by people. You know, we can't give a stated preference method to a shark. Um, I suppose if someone were really smart, they could figure out a, an animal behaviorist could figure out a way to have sharks make choices. But um, but currently we haven't figured that one out yet. So it, it's all values to people. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Johnson. I will now move into the next agenda item, and I will introduce you to Professor Robert Constanza, that works at the University College of London and is founder of Ecological Economics Journal. His areas of expertise include ecological economics, ecosystem services, landscape ecology, integrated ecological and socioeconomic modeling. He will introduce us into the Common Assets Trust for Marine Stewardship concept. Thank you, Professor Constanza, for being here with us and sharing your studies and work. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Nice to be with you all. And I'll try sharing my screen. Let's see. Make sure this works. And we don't have too much time. Um, <clears throat> Um, what are you seeing? Is that working? You see the yes, screen? We, yeah, we, we can yes. see it. Both. Okay, good. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to talk about how to value ecosystem services. You've heard a lot about that uh, already. Um, <clears throat> myself and, and uh, Marcello following me uh, are going to talk about um, how do we manage these ecosystems? Whoops. <clears throat> um, in a way that that uh, takes into account um, the values that we're seeing. I mean, we, we know that uh, these ecosystems are are very complex. Their connection with human well-being is very complex. We we certainly don't know all of that all uh, all that we need to know about that. Um, and I think in general, uh, we need to protect uh, the entire ecosystem, including all of the species that that interact uh, within it. Uh, because we know that it ha they have both direct and indirect um, impacts on on human well-being and the sustainability of that well-being. So how do we how do we actually do that? We also know that we're in the Anthropocene epoch, you know, a, a, a time in history when when human impacts on our ecological life support system are are huge and and significant. And that means we can no longer ignore our interdependence uh, with with the rest of nature. We can't continue with business as usual. We have to, if our goal is to create a sustainable and desirable Anthropocene, uh, I think we need to think and act um, quite, quite differently than, than we have been. And that means to recognize that we need to build an economy and a society that's based on the goal of sustainable well being of humans and the rest of nature. And this maybe gets at that issue of are we talking about an anthropocentric view or an ecocentric view? I think either form of centric is not really the right, the right approach here. Um, we're talking about uh, inter, interdependence between humans and the rest of nature, recognizing that we're all part of this larger uh, ecological, uh, ecological system. And our goal is really to, um, uh, to try to create sustainable human well-being. And that's going to depend on creating well-being well for uh, the rest of the system as well. Um, <clears throat> one way to look at this also is that um, ecosystems and their services, the natural capital, doesn't flow directly into human well-being. We have, it has to interact with the other forms of assets uh, that that our uh, our economy and our society uh, maintain. Uh, not just our built infrastructure, but also our social capital, our human capital, individuals and their uh, their individual well-being. So, this is obviously a very complicated and very transdisciplinary um, sort of effort uh, to understand those interactions and and to try to get the balance right uh, between these different types of assets and how they, and how they contribute. And I think uh, in the marine system, that's, that's extremely important as well. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, this paper that we published recently, Marcello and I, and a couple of other uh, co-authors, 
uh, on using this idea of common asset trusts uh, as an institutional framework uh, within which uh, we can perhaps better manage, better steward um, ecosystems and their services and in collaboration with and in conjunction with uh, the other assets that contribute uh, to human well-being. Um, why do we need to do that? Well, um, <clears throat> different uh, kinds of assets have different characteristics. Um, that, and this is one way of looking at those characteristics. On the, on the left-hand axis uh, is this characteristic of rivalness. You know, to what extent does my benefiting from, from an asset um, you know, prevent you from benefiting from an asset? If, if it does, then those, those, uh, those things are considered to be rival. Um, and on the, the, uh, the x-axis at the top is ease of exclude, exclusion. So how much can I prevent you from benefiting from something, uh, you know, unless, you, unless you pay me, for example. Um, and that, that's a spectrum there from easy to you know, approaching impossible in terms of exclusion. Can we put fences around something? Can we, can we measure uh, you know, how, much, uh, how much of something we're, we're using, um, et cetera? Uh, markets work relatively well or can work well um, under certain conditions for goods and services that are rival and excludable. Uh, but when you get away from the upper left corner and into the lower right corner, you're talking about uh, public goods, you're talking about common access, uh, common access goods uh, and public services, um, et cetera. And I think this is where um, much of our marine systems uh, really, really lie. Uh, they're not, they're not uh, goods and services that are uh, exclu easily excludable uh, or, or rival. Uh, we all benefit uh, from many of the services of, of the oceans. Not all, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, whales and, and other cetaceans, uh, you know, can be hunted and captured and, um, and that some of that can be incorporated into to market exchanges. But, but I think in general, <clears throat> the, uh, the benefits of marine systems and many other ecosystems are, um, are public goods. So we have to manage them in that way. And uh, in developing markets for ecosystem services, I think we have to be very careful with that. Uh, I think we can use economic incentives uh, to, uh, to, to modify behavior around, uh, around ecosystems. Uh, but in order to actually market in an effective way, uh, many of these services, I think the, the burdens, uh, the transaction costs uh, are, often, are often far too high. Uh, to actually, you know, um, put them into this into this category, uh, even if we could, and I think we also need to, to recognize the distinction between um, privatization and valuation. Uh, so valuing these non-market goods and services, as Professor Johnson was talking about, is something that we that we can do, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we want to privatize them and trade them uh, in markets. But we do want to manage them in a way that continues so that they continue to have the benefits uh, that, we're, that we're able to measure. So um, <clears throat> Eleanor Ostrom, who uh, was I think the first female to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics uh, several years ago, um, <clears throat> did a lot of her work studying indigenous communities and how they managed uh, these common asset resources, uh, these public goods. Uh, etc. And she came up with a set of principles from looking at a whole range of different communities that had done that successfully. You know, what were the design principles? What did they, what did they have in common that allowed them to manage these common assets uh, successfully and sustainably um, <clears throat> without privatizing them, keeping them as common assets, uh, but managing them effect effectively. They did have to have clearly defined boundaries. Uh, so they can't be open access resources. And Garrett Hardin's famous uh, idea of the tragedy of the commons, it was really the tragedy of open access to the commons, not, not commons in general. Uh, but if you have a commons that does have clearly defined boundaries, <clears throat> um, there has to be a, a whole range of other uh, characteristics. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do also with collective uh, arrangements and graduated sanctions and conflict resolution mechanisms. Um, a lot of this has to be developed uh, by the participants in a, in a collaborative way. So people need to design the rules and the, and the norms around how to manage their commons and how to, how to enforce uh, the regulations that they, that they come up with. So um, our challenge was, well, how do you, how do you bring that, uh, how do you scale that up? Uh, how do you scale some of those ideas up into, um, into what, 
uh, we're doing now, and particularly uh, how to manage uh, the marine uh, ecosystems and the, the ocean commons. Uh, <clears throat> along with um, uh, Eleanor and Peter Barnes and, uh, and a few other uh, co-authors several years ago, back in 2008, uh, we uh, proposed that, that uh, the atmosphere was one of our uh, biggest remaining common open access, common resources, and that we should um, create a common asset trust or an atmospheric trust uh, to help manage uh, this, this, uh, this common asset. How would that work? <clears throat> well, we need an institution that would basically recognize that this is community property. It's owned by all of us on earth and that those that damage that property can be charged for those damages and those that benefit those assets can be rewarded for doing that. So we can, we can use financial incentives uh, to, uh, to, do, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to manage this resource, uh, but we also need to make it clear that the main goal is to protect the asset, uh, to manage it effective, uh, sustainably and well, because it does have uh, this whole range of positive benefits. Um, <clears throat> what we're talking about now, and, and um, uh, one way of thinking about that is, well, we need to you know, claim the sky really as our, as our common asset. Uh, and there's a website you can take a look at uh, and a, um, <clears throat> uh, a list of uh, signees uh, to this idea that, uh, that we should create an atmospheric trust and begin to think of the atmosphere in that way in order to engage um, not only the, the legal system, in fact, the, there's the, uh, the public trust doctrine uh, is really a, a legal principle behind um, uh, doing something like this, but also to engage the general public in recognizing that this is uh, that, that climate change is, is something that's really um, harming all of us, and that uh, and that it's it's uh, damaging an asset that we all uh, we all sort of own in common. Um, <clears throat> the question then is, how do we extend that uh, to uh, the uh, the ocean? And that's what Marcello is going to talk about uh, in a second. Uh, so he'll go into a little bit more detail about our proposal. Whoopsie, for creating a uh, an ocean trust. Uh, but I think the other advantage of this sort of system is that uh, it can allow uh, better public-private partnerships. How do we get investments uh, in these sorts of, um, in protecting assets like the ocean, like the atmosphere, uh, if we can uh, recognize uh, that if we can create a, um, a, a, a common asset trust, then we can also uh, try to estimate to what extent does private investment in that trust contribute to private returns uh, from those assets? And to what extent does public investment contribute to, to public returns? And begin to build a more collaborative approach to investing in those resources. It's not all about the government. It's not all about uh, private, uh, uh, private in, uh, firms or individuals investing, but it really does gonna take a, a collaboration between those, those, uh, those different types of actors. Uh, but it requires, <clears throat> I think, an overarching institution uh, that can balance uh, those, those inputs, that can decide on how best to invest those, those resources in ways that, that protect the asset. That's the whole idea behind a trust, is that the trustees are, are um, <coughs> required uh, to, uh, to, to do what the best they can uh, to, maintain the, uh, to maintain the asset. Okay, I'll stop there. And maybe we could take a couple of direct questions, and otherwise, uh, we'll let Marcello go on and uh, and and uh, do the rest of this, and we could take more general questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Constanza, uh, for your presentation. It's very interesting, also in line with uh, the talk of Shami to developing these uh, systems that hold the economical evolution of nature. Uh, I will uh, give the floor if you want to make a specific question to uh, Professor Constanza. And uh, before introducing Mar Marcello, is someone from the participants that want to have some questions or clarifications? I see Robert Johnson. Yeah, um, just a, a quick um, 
quick curiosity. Um, to, uh, really, really interesting, and I've, I've, I've seen a little bit about this before, but uh, out of curiosity, so so private investment in, in this trust would would presumably imply some kind of privatizable private benefit that that would be received from the trust in some way, shape, or form to these entities. Um, what are you envisioning in terms of how that, yeah, you know, how that would take place to to mo to motivate kind of private actors to say, okay, we want to issue a green bond or, or what have you? Right. Well, well, for example, if um, private actors were investing in protecting coral reefs, right. and you know, so it would be dive operators, for example, okay. All right. uh, they invest in protecting the coral reef, they're going to get some return because they'll have better you know, um, better tourism, um, you know, more returns from their, from, for their business. So they get a direct private return. At the same time, the coral reefs are going to be doing all of the other things that coral reefs do, and there'll be a public return. So you can get a collaboration between the, the, uh, the public investment. The government wants to protect the coral reefs as well for all the public returns. So how do you balance those? And how do you sort of convince the private, both the private and the public uh, parties that they're getting, you know, they're getting something for their money, uh, and they're and not. That, and so, how not. would you how would you deal with the free ride? Because if I'm say I'm a dive operator, why wouldn't I? Do, okay, let someone else pay for that trust, and I'll just kind of happily gain the benefit on the private side. I know. Right. Well, I think that's uh, peer pressure um, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and and other sorts of of, uh, of, of things where or or some sort of government government uh, pressure. Right, right, uh, okay. To say that, hey, you know, guys, you guys should be paying your your fair share. You are getting a good return. You know, I think the key the key part of it though is the measurement issue. You know, so how can you distinguish the the returns on these investments? And that's going to require an understanding of how the system functions and what the returns. You know, what kinds of things would benefit um, the the uh, the system? As you were saying, it's really a lot of it comes down to understanding the underlying biophysical and ecological relationships, and we certainly uh, need to know a lot more about those things, but um, the trust itself uh, could invest in just that kind of research, and so in a way, it's a it, it's also a way of funding research into into how the system functions and how best how best to manage it. Um, and, you know, in the same way that if you were managing a financial trust, you'd like to know more about what you're investing in, and you might be you might want to fund some some research into that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert, for your question and Robert for your presentation. Is there anyone else that would like to make some questions to uh, Professor Constanza? It seems known. So our last speakers from today session is Marcelo Hernandez Blanco. He has studies on ecological economics from the Australian National University and biodiversity, wildlife and ecosystem health from the University of Edinburgh, among other uh, titles. Over the past decades, he has worked on topics related to natural capital valuation, green and blue economy, financial mechanisms for conservation, environmental policy design, climate change, environmental management, including the IBES assessment and other global initiatives. He has also been working with uh, Robert Constanza in this Common Asset Trust for Marine Stewardship, but Marcello will be presenting us now specifically the case of the whales. Marcello, thank you very much for your contributions and please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, let me start sharing my screen and, and thank you, Bob, for, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Also with, with Bob, that was my PhD supervisor some years ago. So it's, it's great to present together this idea. Um, can, can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So uh, this is an ongoing research and uh, therefore, um, Everything is unpublished, but also we would love to have that feedback uh, from you. So the the Q and A, it's it's super important for us because we we really want to get that that feedback from from you, the experts on 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 cetaceans, right? 
So uh, this is how to, this presentation is how to build or to create uh, something similar as what Bob presented uh, for the atmosphere. How, do, how can we build it, build it for, for the ocean, right? Um, with so much different complexities, et cetera. And um, I think our presentation is also um, part of the end point of what we want to achieve through what we're doing with the, with the table. So we're recognizing which functions are important to produce which services from, from our well-being depends from the services of, of whales and how do we value that? But then how are we gonna use those values, right? Because we often hear a trillion dollars, a billion dollars. Yes, but how, how do we implement that into a specific practices that at the end is gonna change behavior and are gonna create these specific, uh, you know, management strategies that we need to store in a sustainable way uh, our natural capital, right? So um, that's that's the the link of of different you know uh, elements that that I see here and and this presentation and Bob's presentation is part of of what we want to go from doing all that stuff that that I mentioned before and which is part of the goal of the that workshop here. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here uh, on the background because we we all know this, but. Uh, Specific things that I, I want to highlight is, well, the, the, the ocean, our biggest blue natural capital and their ecosystem services provide these services at different scales, right? And this is part of what we were uh, speaking uh, at yesterday's session. First, for example, we have our national commons, right? And Bob was referring to coral reefs and how can we develop these uh, institutions and financial mechanisms to uh, store uh, sustainably coral reefs, mangroves as, as well, right? These are part of the quote unquote property of the government and the citizens of, of that government, right? These, those are our national commons. And, and with commons, well, we already uh, heard uh, Bob's explanation, what we're referring as, as, as commons, right? So it's, uh, and he all, already referred to the so-called strategy of the commons here, the idea is, is to see how we eliminate that open access nature of these common resources and, uh, you know, create the, the governance that it's needed. Then we have global govern, uh, commons and uh, lots of, uh, there's a, an ongoing discussion at the United Nations on areas beyond national jurisdiction, specifically biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which we, you know, abbreviate as BBNJ or ABNJ, where high seas, where many of cetaceans live or go through their migratory, um, you know, corridors are part of, right? So this is, this is key to address in, in these discussions. And actually part of the discussions under the UN right now on their, uh, for the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction focuses on how to be, how to create these uh, marine protected areas beyond our area, uh, our na our national jurisdiction, right? So, how would that governance would look like, and who's gonna pay to manage those uh, those areas, right? So, these are some of the questions that that we want to address here. Also, migratory species, the the north and the south poles are are global commons somehow. Um, so this is what we're taking in consideration, but also what it makes it very complex is that we have an interaction uh, between the national and, 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 the, and the global commons, right? These systems are not separated. When, when we thought about um, creating and writing this, this, this paper on, on, the, on the ocean trust uh, at the beginning, we, we look at it at, as a, the atmosphere as just one, but then we start, you know, talking about the the, the complexities um, that that this interaction between global and national commons present. Uh, sorry, Barbara. I think I someone has a mic open, so I, I hear just a little bit of of that in the background. Not sure if it is you, but anyway. Um, so the the marine commons is is the one of the best examples of an open access uh, 
resource. Um, and that's part of the great degradation that is happening, right? Uh, part of the overfishing, part of the um, issues about, you know, uh, managing migratory species and, and, and different ecosystems that are in, in the high sea. So that's, that's a complexity that we need to address somehow from, from the political point of view. And related to that is the ocean finance gap, right? There's a, a huge conservation finance gap right now of, of billions of, of dollars. So how are, we, how are we gonna close that finance gap in order to put in practice those management strategies? So uh, that's, that's part of the background that, that we're thinking uh, uh, when we're creating these, these ocean trusts. And this is an illustration that, that hasn't been published. It's gonna be in our, in our paper on how all these different common assets or common, uh, yeah, yeah, commons interact, right? We have national or yeah, national green commons. For example, we could have here a forest or a mangrove that if it is being cut down or burned releases um, uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which is also a, a common, which uh, Bob was referring to as well. We could also have an impact from, uh, you know, forest uh, deforestation on coral reefs, which would be part of our blue commons. So that's the first interaction between green and, and, and blue commons. And, and beyond, beyond that, we end up having through now uh, such an interconnected system, for example, plastic pollution that is going towards our, our blue commons or fishing fishing nets and fishing gears that are in the national blue commons end up in the in the global blue commons in the high seas, having a, a great impact on what um, on the species and the ecosystem. And then we have this interaction uh, where migratory species is an excellent example uh, where uh, where we put it as mixed blue commons, right? So how can we build a system of governance uh, that can address all these complexities and all the political issues that are behind? And, and this uh, huge ocean finance finance gap, right? So, so our, our idea and our proposal refers to uh, the common asset trust, right? This is not designing a a cat like a like the animal. Uh, so these are the common asset trust. Uh, how how do we design it? And it's just a a general uh, proposal with very general steps of course there, it is more, more much more complex than this but in a general way what we have to do is well we have to uh, select the the natural capital and and assess it and and this is going to be the trust that we want to protect among the, the among the parties right being the coral reef the 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 atmosphere a certain portion of the ocean uh, a whale etc and then we do our ecosystem services selection um, and, and valuation is not always needed, but it, it really helps specifically, specifically for cost benefit analysis to estimate the return of investment. We would have here a natural return, right? A, a natural profit, but also an economic and social profit. Uh, and this is exactly what we are addressing at this point of of this workshop, right? So it, it's important to highlight it here in this uh, method of, of designing this, um, this governance scheme. Then what is really important is, okay, so let's, uh, this, is our, this is our asset. It provides these services that are valuing certain amounts of dollars or, or whatever, but it's facing these threats that we need to uh, address, right? Because we, we cannot, um, the, our trust that provides all these benefits to our well-being is being threatened by different, by different, uh, you know, uh, environmental, social, and economic issues. And then we build this institutional arrangement um, to protect the trust, uh, which is what Bob already talked about in terms of the common asset trust, in terms of the different, um, you know, the eight principles of Ostrom on how to govern um, com uh, common pool resources, you develop them, the management strategies that of course the International Whaling Commission has been working a lot on, on this. 
And then we, you have to build the financial mechanism, right? So we, we have these great ideas on how to manage the strategy, uh, the, 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 the asset we want to build to create new um, marine protected areas. We want to put in place this amazing technology like the, the, the one uh, Ralph was referring in Chile, but how, where does the money is gonna come from to put that in place, right? And sometimes we get lost in, in, in this step and, 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 it's, and it's key. And at the end, what we need is, well, to evaluate the system, to monitor our results, results and then to adapt and start it again if, it is, if, if we need to, to do it again. So um, I'm putting here the different um, key principles uh, from Eleanor Ross from on governing the commons that, that Bob were, were mentioning, right? So each, each of them are related to each one of, of these uh, steps in different ways, right? So uh, this is of course totally related to, to the framework that Bob was, was presenting. So uh, this is my final uh, slide. How does it look like, or how would it look like uh, to do it for whales? Um, so in our paper, we're gonna propose three, perhaps uh, we're still um, you know, writing the paper, but we might end up proposing three different trusts. One for national blue commons, another one for gl global uh, commons. And this one is for uh, those transboundary or mixed um, blue uh, commons, right? Uh, and and because of the theme of the uh, the of the workshop, of course, I'm gonna put here the example of whales. And since you know uh, I'm in Costa Rica and we received so many humpback whales, I, I decided to do it on humpback whales. This is just an example. So the asset, the natural capital, it's humpback whales, but also their migratory uh, corridors, right? So the natural capital is. It's, it's both put it together. And it, this also reminds me us that we, we have to be careful here when we speak about ecosystem services and we translate that to a whales because whales is not an ecosystem. So there's there might be some issues on doing that translation, but here I, I put it or the, the species embedded in the, in the ecosystem, which could be others for, of course, but uh, I, I, I wanted to speak about the migratory corridors uh, that, that these uh, species follows, right? And, and it was also related to the question that I was asking Ralph on, on who owns this, this asset. Then we prioritize uh, the ecosystem services. We're watching for, of course, for, for Costa Rica. Uh, I was telling uh, late, uh, before that we have a, a community that depends entirely on whale watching for their well-being, they they don't do anything more than well uh, that this touristic activity, right? And and it also relates with what David uh, was telling about a, a community that uh, in in Iceland that actually well watching disappeared because or supposedly because of climate change. So it's it's a very very vulnerable activity, uh, and also climate regulation that we also have addressed in in the table that that were completed. So this is the trust that, that we need to protect, right? These are the first two steps from, from that simple method that I was, that I was uh, showing you. Some prioritizing uh, threats, for example, you know, we know that unsustainable fishing has an impact on, on humpback whales and, and many other types of cetaceans, shipping strikes, which in the case of Costa Rica, it's very important since we have, you know, uh, very, very near the, the Panama Canal. Uh, and, and, and that's part of that migratory route from, from the wells that comes from, the, uh, from Antarctica to, to our waters. Pollution, plastic mainly, and climate change. What's the same whale watching, right? Uh, this is another issue. So, uh, and this again, it's just uh, um, a first idea. We could call it this common asset trust, uh, trust the humpback whale trust. It could be the ocean trust, it could be, the, the blue trust, whatever, however you want to call it. And the one, the, the people that is gonna administer, uh, that should administer this trust should be the governments, uh, the industry should be involved as, as for example, the, the, the example that Bob was providing on this public private partnership to uh, manage uh, common resources such as, as reefs 
international organization, of course, where you know uh, the the International Whaling Commission would be uh, a key actor here. And and I forgot, but here, of course, we would have indigenous communities as well, local communities, etc. So what the trust is going to do is that it's going to provide those funding to the management strategies that we need to address those uh, the, the threats with the uh, highest uh, impact on, on the asset, which is whales in this case, right? So we could start doing a network of MPAs, for example, Costa Rica during COP26 announced with Colombia, Panama, and Ecuador, a huge marine protected area, a uh, network of marine protected areas that is gonna be, I think, one of, of, the, of the biggest in, in, in the world. And, and how do they, how are they going to coordinate these efforts between countries is it's one of our key questions that we need to address here, because they both share resources, for example, there's the hammer hammerhead shark that goes between these four countries, and that's a, a common uh, asset trust. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, a common uh, resource that provides different uh, benefits from different people. Another one that it's been uh, develop it's the uh, marine uh, mammals areas uh, and this is an effort that that many of you might know i spoke with eric hoyt about this and and actually we're having a workshop on this in costa rica next month sustainable fishing you know changing uh, the the arts of fishing changing gears etc sustainable shipping we're watching standards etc but how are we going to pay for all of these management strategies, then we, we need to come up with the funding sources. And what we need to consider is that these funding sources ideally should be um, connected with the, with the ecosystem services that we're addressing and connected also with uh, the, the threat, right? Because you know we could put a tax on computers and that money we could use it for, for the trust but that doesn't make uh, lots of, 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 of sense here, right? And, and it's part of what we did here in Costa Rica with payment for ecosystem services, right? Part of the services that we wanted to address was climate regulation. So we put a tax on gasoline and part and 90% of that tax or 90% or of our payment for ecosystem services scheme comes from, from that tax. So here, just a few ideas, uh, for example, sustainable banking, how the role of banks providing funding only for sustainable shipping or sustainable uh, fishing, sustainable uh, whale watching, shifting subsidies, all these subsidies that goes towards uh, on sustainable fishing co could go towards the, the trust and the trust could use part of this money to implement these activities. Penalties is the one that Ralph was talking about. Uh, and also another point from Ralph was the carbon markets, environmental damage compensation, Although it, this, it's, it, it has some, some issues. Corporate biodiversity management, and, and this is where environmental management goes beyond the, the, you know, the regular uh, environmental issues, but really addresses biodiversity in a sense, which biodiversity are we impacting as a business, but also our business depend on specific uh, biodiversity. So how, how do we address both dependencies and, uh, and impacts? User fees, for example, we could put a fee on, on tourism, on diving, for example, or on shipping, which of course right now it's it's not technically or politically viable, right? With with oil going up and the the, the container crisis, uh, et cetera, impact investment, payment for ecosystem services and, and taxes, right? If, if what would happen if we tax plastic? And, and this would be also interesting now that the UN it's um, it's it's starting to write this treaty on on, on plastic, which is going to be legally binding. Um, and then we have monitoring on 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 the management strategies. And yeah, that that's that's part of, of our idea right now on how how to implement this this idea that Bob presented of, of common asset trust. And uh, it would be super helpful if if we can hear from from your feedback. What are we missing? Uh, if this made sense or what else uh, should be incorporated in our in our analysis that's my email so feel free to to, to contact me and keep this uh, discussion alive thank you 
Thank you, Marcello, for the interesting uh, presentation. And I will now ask uh, for participants if they have some questions or want to discuss about this uh, common asset trust that uh, uh, Professor Constanza and, uh, and Marcello have uh, introduced us today. It seems no, there's no uh, questions from the floor. I would like to uh, congratulate you for the, the work and all the speakers uh, from the interesting presentation that they gave us today. I now get the sense that we have many covered many different issues of over the workshop yesterday we had the discussion trying to get the scientific outcomes of the contribution to ecosystem services to translate it into socio-economic valuation and we had also how these scientific threats measurements can now uh, be shaped into schemes for financing conservation strategy, which is going be even beyond just mere valuation of the ecosystem services. And we have to also a very uh, good presentation from uh, Robert Johnson on the valuation methods. So I think we have covered most of the issues that we will be using during next month day for conclusions. And we have now some uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes more to be able to start with open discussions on, it was supposed to identify methods to be applied to assess the contribution of cetacean and potentials for the development of best practice guidelines, which is in line with the uh, presentation from uh, Professor Johnson. Uh, yesterday, we started also with the, this uh, matrix from the scientific committee that we invite people to review. And again, I thank Marcelo, Marcelo for having a look at it and we will come back to it. But I will ask soon for uh, volunteers to have us create a small group so we can uh, summarize with, of course, the help of the reporters, what we have been uh, received, the, in the, the outcomes from day one and two from the workshop and then we can uh, start uh, looking at the table also to get some draft prepared for draft recommendation to uh, be the focus of day three, in day three, which is uh, next Monday, 11 April. We still will have two more presentations and then the rest of the, of the session will be dedicated to create a strategy, identify the knowledge gaps and what we should uh, compile or structure for the future uh, work of the IWC in this topic. We don't expect at this point to have a social economic valuation of citations, like how much they value, but at least a roadmap to follow. So uh, before, uh, moving to uh, discuss what are, will be the major issues and conclusions. I will ask uh, volunteers for forming this uh, small uh, working group so we can have some advances 
in uh, in next for next Monday. Uh, Marcello, do you want to raise your hand or you volunteer? I think both. Uh, although I don't uh, totally understand what would be the the purpose of of the of the small groups, but but if if you can explain it again, please. But also, I don't know if if we could take a, a another look to the table today and and perhaps. You know, taking advantage that that Bob was is is here today, and would love to to hear part of 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 what he thinks because I found several uh, you know challenges or fundamental problems with the framework. Um, so I just want to make sure that everything that we do from now it's going to lead us to to a, a good result. Yes. Thank you. We will go back soon to the table uh, to check it again. But uh, the, the small group is to uh, structure discussion on the third day and come up with some uh, I general ideas from the previous days and work or have the discussion into those ideas. For example, uh, I can have some uh, suggestions which is uh, with the scientific committee table, then identif when we identify the associated socioeconomic, which we will review soon now a little, but then again on Monday, to structure the future work of the IWC, perhaps is uh, selecting some socioeconomic prioritized uh, services and start evaluation, or how to advance in a framework to fund, to make this uh, trust, financing trust for the future work of uh, conservation of cetacean, either at the country level or at international level. So it's rather a discussion of the small group to wrap up with all what have been discussed and try to structure it for the third day. So I, I, I will take notes for who want to volunteer. It will be through emails over these three days or tomorrow and after tomorrow. I can so, help, yeah. Thank you, Marcello. Please, the ones that are interesting or available to help with this task. Raise your hand. Okay, DJ, DJ, Zach, Cliver, Elsa, Cabrera. Perfect, Zach, I already noted. Is there anyone else that would like to contribute? It seems none so i would like now to ask uh, dj if he can we have 20 minutes left if he can come back to the uh, sharepoint table uh, yes the, yeah thank you thank you barbara one. i will i will share my screen now hold on okay thank you And uh, just to make sure, it is the table that uh, Marcello has uh, started to fill. Uh, yes, I downloaded that from the SharePoint site uh, earlier and uh, I just need to find it, hold on. Thank you. Barbara? Yes. Uh, can I just make a commentary in my screen while DJ finds that table? Okay. Um, yeah, no, what I was gonna tell you, and I think it's part of, of the issues that I found, and um, this is a paper that Bob uh, published and other colleagues in 1917, 
uh, is that we are trying, we are using this, this framework. We're, we're trying it to do it very linearly, uh, identifying the structure, the function, the service, then how we, we can value it. Um, and although it's much more complicated, the, the, the other proposal I think would be much more helpful. And I think it would look like this, um, especially, and as you're gonna see in the table, or you already know, the big majority of, of the services that uh, the scientific committee proposed are not services per se, but functions and related to nutrient cycling, right? So many of them are on this side. So I think uh, the one of the main challenges that we have here at the workshop, or one of the ideas that I would suggest is that instead of asking how these functions translate to individual ecosystem services, looking into in this linear uh, way, row by row, uh, well, perhaps it would be more helpful to ask which of these functions under a bundle approach support the health of the ocean or specific uh, you know, activities because, and I'm, and I'm saying this because the big majority are supporting or functioning or functions, right? Uh, it would be uh, different if, if we choose other services that I know the, the scientific uh, committee is not interested for this particular uh, workshop, right? And uh, so I think that's one proposal and, and another proposal which I think since we, we have very, uh, different experts here in evaluation and, and whales, et cetera, would be to, you know, to incorporate other services as, as, as well, right? And, uh, and these other services could work as an umbrella to protect these functions that the scientific committee is interested in. So this is my, my general take of, of the table and, and, and uh, part of the approach that we could follow. Excellent. Thank you for your suggestion. I think the, they are very sensitive. Uh, what do the participant thinks about the proposal? Um, Marcello was suggesting us to change uh, the viewpoint from the table and try to uh, relate, include the other services as uh, an umbrella and then try to modify a little table. I, I guess that was your suggestion in order to be more easy, easy for socioeconomic perspective to deal with. Yeah, and, and you know, a, a third problem is that we're trying to use a framework for a species that it was designing for ecosystems. So many of the, the, uh, of the proposed functions doesn't, and it's never gonna, well, not never, but it's very difficult to translate to services because they are very particular for, for that species. And uh, the only way would to model a food cascading or I don't know, yeah, framework on how everything relates with other species that end up providing a specific service as fishing, for example. So um, I, I think we, we need to address those three fundamental problems that, not problems, but issues that, that we, ha we have uh, with that table. And, and we have brilliant people here, and which might yes. suggest things. Thank, maybe, thank you very maybe, much. Maybe I could add one more thing and uh, to put on the agenda, we're just starting with this idea of the uh, ocean trust. And I think it would be really helpful to maybe put that idea on the agenda and get some feedback from the IWC and, and your group, um, you know, as to uh, <clears throat> about that idea, whether they, they would consider participating in, a, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a project or a group to further develop it, or just any, any sort of feedback would be helpful. So maybe you could put that on, put that in the agenda for tomorrow. Thank you, uh, Robert. Next uh, day, next session days will be on Monday, 11 uh, April. So tomorrow and after tomorrow we won't meet, but on Monday we will meet and uh, with the, in the small group we will probably include the discussion on the ocean trust to be discussed uh, for the group in the conclusions of the workshop and probably it will come out, out as a recommendation if the group decide 
as this. And uh, I understand also the third uh, concern has the system of uh, environment, the CEA accounting and the ocean accounting that the UN fra framework was being developing. Also yesterday pointed out that there was the ecosystem uh, valuation model and not a species valuation model and the species were like sort of conditioning the ecosystem valuation. So it's very interesting to get this insight but because it, it's, the workshop was indeed developed very linearly from this is the contribution of the species, how much it will cost. So it's good to have this broaden uh, concepts. Mm -hmm. Marcello? Yeah, but it doesn't mean that we cannot apply it. For example, well, I don't know if Bob is still here. He, he and other colleagues did uh, some research in, in China on valuing pandas, right? Uh, oh, he, he's still here. Or there's some ecosystem services that are based on species, specific species like pollination or pest control, but are very specific. The, the problem is that the ones that we chose or the, the, the ones that the scientific uh, committee chose, but uh, yeah, I don't know if, if there's time or if, if Bob can also talk about that example of, of pandas and how it could be related to, to whales here. Well, the, <clears throat> briefly, the pandas can be considered kind of an umbrella species. People are, are interested in, in uh, conserving pandas, like people are, are interested in conserving whales. But <clears throat> you have to recognize that you know, pandas need habitat, whales need habitat. So if you want to protect whales, you have to protect the whole system that the whales are, are a part of. And so it's, um, <clears throat> it's one way of, of uh, recognizing that interdependence and sort of utilizing that to, to, uh, to help with the protection activities. Is that what you meant, Marcello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was part of, of what I was uh, suggesting that um, we could you know, bring other services uh, to the table and to the assessment in order to use that services as, as an umbrella to protect the other functions that are they they had you know suggested, um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo and Roberts, for your suggestion. I will now ask DJ if he can share the the, the screen, and we can go very uh, quickly through this uh, table. Yesterday we were discussing. For those who were not attending, please, DJ. Uh, Barbara, if you, if you want to finish your thought, that's fine. I just wanted to suggest now that the table is on the screen um, and, and I hate to ask Mar Marcello to go back through his fundamental concerns with the table, but it might be more meaningful if he were to repeat some of those concerns now that we see the table on the screen. Yeah, sure, no problem. Do you want me to do it now? Yep. C can you hear me? Yes, uh, I, I'm not sure if Barbara can hear you, but uh, I can, so I guess proceed. Uh, perhaps Barbara lost her audio. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm here, hearing now. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, let's, uh, yeah. let's, Continue with Marcello. Uh, do you want he repeat uh, the three concerns, DJ? That's what I was thinking. It just might be more meaningful now that the uh, table is on the screen. Okay. Let, let me just introduce to the persons that were not able to attend yesterday's session. This table is comes initially from the uh, scientific committee workshop on cetacean and ecosystem functioning. And they uh, develop this list based on nutrient transfer and circulation, which are the green ones, the red ones, or feeding related threats, or blue carbon habitat related threats for cetaceans. And they associated some functions. Yesterday, we wrote reviewed it 
And it was noted that the service that it's in the column there provided by the scientific committee not necessarily was a service from a socioeconomic perspective, but rather a function. So Martello kindly uh, completed uh, column G with what he thinks it's the social economic service associated. And then we were supposed to fill the table. And here I reiterate the invitation to everybody and particularly those that are related to socioeconomic valuation to try to give a review of this table and think about what are these socioeconomic services has did Martello, but then who would be the this beneficiary either and where, what is the local um, special scale, if it's local or global. And if there is like a socioeconomic contribution, what would it be? And today we're supposed to uh, go, can you move the columns? Supposedly we would also associate it if there is a possible valuation method associated to each of these socioeconomic systems. So this is a very basic matrix to make a more, um, how you saw, um, arrange like order what we will do in the future mm -hmm. and uh, this was the columns that yesterday were added to the matrix so we can continue the work in the future to have it as a basis so and today Marcello suggested also to review this uh, this table because it might be a different approach for the same thing as more of, most of the threats identified by the scientific committee are related to the same services. So please, uh, DJ, can you come back to the threats referred and then we can go quickly through the uh, table. If anyone wants to uh, comment on something, please let me know. If you, uh, I have two hand raised, but I cannot see who. Okay, DJ. Uh, sorry, that was a that's a legacy hand. I, I will I will lower it. Uh, okay. I think I think, Mar think Marcello wanted was going to uh, repeat what he said earlier. Um, now that the the, the uh, chart is up on the screen. Okay, uh, I will go with Marcello uh, after Isabella, Isabel Avila, uh, give yes, her opinion. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. I'm Isabel Avila from the uh, University of Hanover and the University of uh, El Valle in Colombia. Uh, I, I was in this workshop and we chose these traits because um, it, 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 we, can, we could measure that. And yes, it is related to the species, but the species are part of the ecosystems and not in uh, all of the world are the same species. And um, we discussed all of these uh, traits. And when, uh, when we um, chose the functions and the, and the service, we uh, about the function uh, it was related to um uh, to to the function in the, in the ecosystem yes and also the service uh, in the ecosystem yeah maybe we we didn't have this um all this all this acknowledgement that we we have in, now in this in this in this meeting that i'm very uh, happy to to to, to be here to learn, not all of the all, the, all of these presentations. But I think uh, I think the traits are are good because you can measure that, and also um, not in all of the countries on 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 in all of the parts are the same species. So the this trait give us um, an idea where there is more benefit benefits uh, according to the. Um, to the species they, they are. The, uh, so 
Uh, yes, I think we can discuss it to, to change. Uh, so as Mar Marcelo said, um, is, 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 um, is, yeah, but, but also I think it's, it's also good to, to remain it so as, as traits. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I Isabel. So I don't know if Marcelo want to take the floor has yeah he, you can point out why you believe it it, it may be a, an addition it's not an addition to the scientific committee table it is already on the report is to make it more uh, workable for the social economical workshop i understand that way sure yes thank you barbara and Gusto en saludarte, Isabel. Un saludo a todas las colombianas y colombianos. Um, so, yeah, and I went really quick through each one of the rows and, uh, and, and, and the majority as the title of like in row number four suggested is on, on nutrient cycle, right? Uh, with the, the problem from a ecosystem services uh, assessment and evaluation is that nutrient cycling, it's, it's a function that supports the other services. So it, it, it itself doesn't always, or the majority of the time, translate in a, in a service in that linear way. So what Isabel was saying, it's, it's quite valuable uh, because, and, and it was the, the first concern that I raised is how can we, instead of going in that linear way, we could instead take this knowledge, which is uh, very valuable, like I was saying, and ask which of these functions could be used as, under a bundle approach, support the health of the ocean. So we would changing the research question instead of, right now the, the question is how these functions translate into services, we should translate that question in how those functions support the health of the ocean, which provides many other services. So I, 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 I think this is an intermediate, in, yeah, intermediate uh, step that, and, and that's part of what we have here. Otherwise, I don't know if we, if, if we, if we can do it like, like you have it right now. And that's also was part of the reason that I was presenting that those two different frameworks from Bob's paper. Um, and uh, the problem is not the framework itself. The problem, I think it's the, the, the functions that we want to translate into, uh, into the service, right? Uh, and, and building on that, I think if it would be possible to bring other services to the table that we could use as an umbrella services that are gonna protect these other ones. But, uh, other services like the, you know, the, the, the education, spiritual existence, bequest, climate regulation, all of those services can be traced back in this linear way. But uh, I, I don't know if, if this is gonna work uh, like the ones that we have in, uh, the, the majority are support, supporting, right? We, we have nutrient cycling a lot. We have also habitat provision. We have um, maintenance of the genetic pool, for example. And I'm using you know, broad, broad uh, ecosystem services categories to try to translate uh, these functions into services. And, and I think we only had one, uh, which was climate regulation that we've spoken before. And perhaps it was one of the only ones that, can, that we really can translate that function into a service. And, 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 you know, this is key because at the end we want to value this and we want to use those values to change behaviors and to, you know, to design new policies. So we really want to start uh, to do a good start. But I, I mean, I, I don't want to have a, a monopoly of, 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 of the saying here. I could be totally wrong, which is my, my opinion. Thank you, uh, Marcello. I think we can come in the small group to review this table and come up with an alternative proposal for Monday. And uh, DJ, uh, before giving you the, the, the floor, can you 
slow uh, go down roll down the the table a little because i can you can see that most of these threads are has identified by Marcello where nutrient cycle nutrient cycle maintenance of genetic diversity nutrient cycle so probably many of these threads are uh, it can stop there stop there are um can be uh, merged until one to one specific issue. But there are others, for example, that Marcello pointed out, not an ecosystem service at all. For example, the consumption rate. And then they are over the over the list, several non not an ecosystem services. So I wonder if we should these threats put it outside the list and then review or check if there will be any socioeconomic relation to ecosystem services or not because it, it's very interesting and um, also from uh, for the scientific committee to get the insights from our workshop and uh, dj now please could uh, take the floor well, I'm certainly happy to discuss this in the small group. I guess it's just a question for Marcelo, and that is whether recognizing that this is a simple table and it really needs to remain a, a simple table, would it be helpful from your perspective as uh, an economist, an ecological economist, that uh, perhaps we relabel the column heading in G to be socioeconomic functions, and then insert a new column that would be socioeconomic services as determined by socioeconomic workshop participants. Would, would that help to um, address some of your concerns? I think it wouldn't, uh, frankly. It wouldn't, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think uh we could even come up with a more dynamic table right I, I i mean i don't know how set in stone this is but we shouldn't you know limit ourselves to the current structure we could use the information that has been provided in another structure that could perhaps works better for the general objective thank you marcello Okay, I think uh, we are already on time. So we will stop the sessions, today's sessions now. I will give the floor to last uh, comments uh, from the floor before closing the session. DJ, do you want to take the floor or it's your hand? Uh, apologies, I didn't lower my hand. Okay, thank you. So we will close the session uh, today. We will uh, reconvene next March. Uh, sorry, uh, Isabel wanted to take the floor. Yes, yes, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I only have um, uh, a dog, may, maybe. Uh, for example, now, I think first, I think it's, it's good to discuss the table because uh, maybe there is not a direct um, uh, uh, so, uh, eco economic service, but maybe it could be an indirect. So. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's better to 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 discuss deeply this 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 table. Uh, but I have a for example uh, in this trait the first trait body size and and latitude. Uh, yes, we as 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 I mentioned we focused on the ecosystem, but. Uh, but if we if we see uh, now in well watching, for example, the biggest um, the biggest cetacean, so with with a with a huge body size, are more attractive for well watching than the, the the little one. So I don't know if that could be also uh, like a service, like a like a service, no. Uh, so it's it's it's, on, it's a question, yeah. So, so I don't, that I think that maybe is not only an, an, a nutrient cycling, so 
is also maybe um, a, a, a trait that uh, is more attractive for, for, for well watching, for example. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, Marcello? Yeah, just a quick comment on that. I think uh, Isabel is quite right. Uh, and also it, this relates to other services, for example, climate regulation, right? A, a, a bigger you know, body size would hold much more, more carbon, right? So I think that traits are really useful and we can use them as, as part of those uh, elements that define uh, the services that, that we choose, right? Uh, for example, we, we're publishing soon a paper on, on, on ecosystem health that depends on specific elements. Um, and so these are the, those elements that are gonna have an impact on, on those services. That the, the problem here is that uh, although it has an impact on nutrient cycling, perhaps nutrient cycling it's not very transferable to a service, right? And I'm just using the, the first one, but but I think it's it's quite useful. Uh, again, the, the information, I think we could use it uh, in different ways. It's not that I'm not, I don't agree with that. And, and I think it's about a point, it's, it's just perfect. Thank you, Martello. So the small working group will uh, go through the table and I have uh, Marcello, Isabel, DJ, Sack, Elsa Cabrera, and uh, uh, Vicky James on the group. If someone else wants to join the small group, please raise uh, your hand now so I can note you. If not, we will close the session and reconvene on month April for the last two presentations from Selina Stitt and Martina Guagliotto, and then we will move toward the last uh, round discussion and table to uh, summarize the workshop and move forward with the recommendations. Uh, Marcello, do you have last uh, intervention? Just to, just to know how are this uh, small group is gonna work, are, are you gonna, send us an email when to convene, or are we gonna work by email, or how exactly are we gonna function? Yes, I will email uh, to the group, and we will uh, agree uh, by email how we will be advancing this over the next two days, probably. Thank you. And I would like to thank all the participants for attending uh, this session's workshop and all the distinguished speakers that really delighted us with uh, their lectures on several different issues that give us many things to think about it. Thank you very much and see you next Monday. Bye-bye.